Okay. Oh. So, um, I'm looking at the YouTube. I'm pulling up the YouTube now. Okay. So we need to get the slides. Hey, Alex. Set up in here as well, so we can like see them. Do you? Oh, if we go to the scene, you can do that, right? That's in scene. Yeah, that was just the front one that we just picked. Sarah, I would mute. Yeah, so if you had a source in the scene, wait, wait, you can wait, share wait. a window. Sarah, Sarah, mute on the live stream. Mm Then let's just get rid of it real quick. Yeah. Oh, so we have the. Um, test, test, test.
by the Arbor Foundation or whatever. We'll give that a second. So we're good? I think so. Well, there'll, there'll be a delay before we can see it. Why are there five viewers? Oh, yeah, Ron. Okay, we got it here. All right, you can hear us. Is it showing okay? Uh, Keep in mind yeah. that the camera's right there. So it's cool. So, um, it's showing the... Yeah, I don't know why it's I think it's lagging, right? Yeah. Is it not working? Okay. Audio right. Just a microphone. Oh, uh, you're on camera and video right now. Just so you know. Oh, hello. It's a good thing I didn't. You know, whatever. With who? Try click through, or, or, or you don't have to click through. It's okay. I can't see your picture. You can't see the picture. There you go. I can see it now. Oh, I just exited out. That's good. I can see your picture. Um, let me test the audio real fast. It's gonna... Yeah, so it's like, oh, it's really <laughs> 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 
All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for waiting five extra minutes. Uh, and welcome to the Spaceport America Cup team's preliminary design review. Uh, my name is Sarah Malaska, and I'm the project manager for this year. So the purpose of the Spaceport team is to compete in the Spaceport America Cup, as the name would suggest. Uh, this competition is hosted by the Experimental Sounding Rocket Association, otherwise known as Ezra by most of you. Uh, and this competition will take place June 17th through 24th of next summer. Uh, this year, our plan is to develop and present Asteria, which is our rocket name for this year, and this is BSLI's most refined and technically advanced high-power rocket. And additionally, another goal of our team is to meet and engage with other members of the intercollegiate rocketry community. Uh, we pride ourselves in really helping out other teams and also connecting with teams from all over the world at our competition. As for the goals and values of our team, every year we aim for a nominal flight in the 30K SRAD category. Uh, this means that our, our apogee that we aim for is 30,000 feet, and the SRAD refers to our motor, which is student research and designs. Uh, we also aim to prioritize health and safety in every meeting, and we have to conform to Ezra's rules on design. Additionally, a, a specific thing that we pride ourselves on is presenting a majority SRAD final design. So while the category only requires our team to have an SRAD motor, we really pride ourselves on making the majority of the rocket SRAD. Um, additionally, we also supplement academics with hands-on engineering experience, and another goal of ours is to maintain a thriving rocketry community at Ohio State. So for our project trajectory and how we've placed that competition in the last few years, uh, last year we placed 82nd overall out of 119 teams and fourth in our category. 
Uh, this is lower than we would have liked. We unfortunately underwent a structural failure at competition last year. Um, and this year, one of our main goals is to understand exactly what went wrong at competition. Uh, additionally, in 2022, we placed slightly better, uh, but we had a lower apogee than expected due to a motor malfunction. Uh, to fix this and to place better this year, we plan to place a greater focus on the analysis, simulation, and testing of our rocket and its components. Um, and then additionally, every year we advance the abilities of our current subteams. Uh, they improve on what we've learned from the past year and from the knowledge that they bring in themselves. Um, additionally, something new that we're doing for the first time this year, uh, at least in a couple years, is implementing air brakes. Uh, and this is to help us better reach our target apogee. Uh, the Space for America Cup is an apogee-based competition. Uh, this means that a majority of our points are based on how close we can get to our 30,000 foot goal. All right, and I'll pass it over to Rom, our DPM, and he will go over how the PDR will work. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rom. I'm the Deputy Project Manager for the uh, Buckeye Space Launch Initiative's uh, Spaceport team. Um, so over the next two hours, you're going to hear from each of our sub-team leads. Um, in their presentations, they're going to cover the sub-team purpose. They're going to talk about their system's requirements for the rocket, um, their design process. Then they're going to give you a system overview of all the moving parts in the rocket, um, during which they'll also discuss challenges they anticipate facing. And then they're going to talk about uh, their risks and mitigation methods to handle those challenges. Um, they're going to cover their uh, roadmap for the rest of the year going forward. And we'll have five minutes for questions at the end of each sub-team presentation. If you haven't already, please pick up a review item disposition up at the front here and a writing utensil as well. Um, it's like a feedback form for us to gauge how well we did at this presentation. So, yeah. Uh, this is the general structure of the team itself. You've already heard from our project manager, Sarah Malaska. Um, my name is Ram Saiganesh. I'm the deputy project manager and the team safety officer. Um, and these are our sub team leads in the order in which they'll present going forward. Um, structures is led by Corey Mays. Aerodynamics is led by Sori Haman. Propulsion is led by Advait Saraf. Avionics is led by Peter Hall. Recovery is led by Calvin Beal. And payload is led by Corey Ireland. Over to Corey to talk about structures. Hello, my name is Corey Mays. I'm the structures lead. Uh, our, sub our project purpose is to construct the airframe of the rocket, allow for integration of other sub-teams into the rocket. Uh, this year, design and manufacture the air brake system, and then validate our design, de design decisions with computational analysis and material testing. System requirements, the parts must withstand loads from supersonic flight to 30,000 feet. Uh, we must have efficient integration of entire rocket. Uh, we must have a smooth finish of airframe, uh, airframe parts to reduce adverse aerodynamic effects. And we need to design the air brakes to produce enough drag, withstand drag loads, and have consistent deployment metrics. All right, design process. Uh, Going to utilize the general process from prior years, carbon fiber and uh, fiberglass epoxy layups. Um, for our nose cone and transition pieces, we're going to be utilizing mold creation. Um, honeycomb bulkhead cores, uh, vacuum bag layups on all our parts. Um, we're machining coupler and air brakes. Uh, we're working with skilled machinists um, to help us with that. And to validate uh, all these uh, designs with FEA on structural components, tensile testing, and recovery bulkhead testing. Uh, system overview. Um, this is what we expect our, our rocket to look like, um, kind of an exploded view of the integrated rocket. Um, the parts that we'll be making are the nose cone, the body tube, recovery bulkhead, uh, the payload systems bay, uh, air brakes, and transition. Uh, most parts are made of carbon fiber, nose cone, body tube, um, carbon fiber. Recovery bulkhead is carbon fiber sandwiched with the honeycomb core. Uh, the payload bay, again, same bulkhead design but with carbon fiber rails. Uh, the air brakes, machined aluminum, and then the transition piece will be fiberglass for um, avionics to transmit uh, radio frequencies through. All right, just to address the last year's uh, structural failure. Um, so, uh, uh, like Sarah said, uh, structural failure. 
uh, we believe was because our nose cone was undersized due to an out of dimension mold plug and um, it, was, it was severely undersized so to try to uh, fix that then they use excessive shim tape um, to bring it back up to dimension to fit in the body tube um, but it's believed that around max Q that the nose cone uh, fluttered and broke out of the body tube and this year obviously um, we need to remake that nose cone mold uh, make it with the correct dimension so that it fits snugly into the body tube and um, has proper rigidity inside the body tube. Uh, air brakes this year, um, shout out to Cam Burford uh, is leading the design on this. Uh, our air brakes are designed to ha uh, be operated by a linkage system actuated by a stepper motor. It's integrated above avionic support on the coupler as you um, as I showed earlier with the uh, overview and so far uh, air brakes the blades have been analyzed by aerodynamics for force values um, and we use those force values in our uh, finite element analysis speaking of our computational analysis um, like I said we did uh, the aerodynamic force on the air brake blades a 2d analysis to simplify we got 57.8 newtons from the aerodynamics team um, zero the the stress or the the torque that we measured was practically zero practically zero dis displacement um so uh, our stepper motor specs were designed or decided by the force from the wind approximated at 200 miles per hour um, gave us a value of 69 ounce inch of max torque um, uh, other computational analysis that we are in the process of and um, planning on completing our recovery bulkhead using the um, design from the recovery team and the, the loads um, expected when the, the main chute deploys um, to analyze our bulkhead, make sure it can withstand those loads. And right now we've completed our body tube and compression. Since we're doing air brakes, the body tube design has changed also with a 5U payload. Our body tube is much longer than last year. Um, with the air brakes, we're planning on cutting slots in for the fins to stick out so I think it's important to do more analyses on um, on the body tube this year uh, just to make sure that it's structurally sound uh, with that we plan on doing a nonlinear analysis on the body tube and the coupler with an applied moment uh, for material testing uh, we we're doing destructive testing on uh, simulated rocket parts essentially uh, so in this example, you can see on the pictures, we have carbon fiber fastened to aluminum to kind of simulate um, how the body tube would be fastened to uh, the coupler or the air brakes. Um, the, the plan is to get uh, force values, loading values, compared to our computational analyses and um, just verify that the design is valid. Uh, plans for testing compression of the fiberglass epoxy filler. Uh, so. One thing that happened last year with the under no, undersized nose cone is we used epoxy filler to kind of beef up the shoulder uh, to make it the right dimension. And so uh, we thought it would be worth it to also do a compression to see um, the loads that that filler can take. Um, but also doing physical testing of the uh, recovery bulkhead and the air brake uh, system. Risk to project success, time shortages. Uh, happens every year and uh, this year of course we have basically the same parts to make and also additional parts to make this year so um, time shortage is definitely a, a, a risk fabrication errors uh, poor layups out of tolerance parts breaks cracks in our pieces um, integration failures um, poor processes leading to broken components and test launch failures such as crash landings uh, we'll need to refabricate parts. Uh, here's a risk matrix um, and risk ma mitigation. So for time shortage, um, the likelihood is likely. Uh, so, and, and the impact is minor. So you can see in the yellow there is time shortage. Uh, the way to mitigate that is stick to a timeline and ensure process efficiencies. Fabrication errors. Um, unlikely and the impact would be minor. Um, the way to mitigate that would be detail-oriented mindset and ensure that the team is prepped for layups. 
Integration failures, unlikely, but it would be significant because it could keep us from launching. Uh, keep tight tolerances and well-documented procedures and label-oriented lines. Um, and test launch failures, possible, and the impact would be major. So uh, we just need to ensure that our processes are efficient. If we need to refabricate, then we can do it in a timely manner. Our plan for the year, um, for the first semester, is when we want to wrap up, uh, when we want to complete most of our material testing in FEA. We want to basically get done with uh, the, the testing that would be required for certain parts before we make them. Um, uh, in October, beginning of October, which is mostly complete by now, is the layup of the bulkheads in the payload systems bay. Um, what we're completing now is making the test motor tube, and I expect that to um, last till the end of November. And then after that, for the rest of the semester, we will be making our body tube. Starting next semester, we'll be creating the nose cone mold. And after that is laying, laying up the nose cone and the transition in the, in the respective molds. And then after that, we'll have all our rocket parts so we can prepare for test launch. Assuming everything goes well with test launch, then we can start preparing for competition launch. Otherwise, we'd have to remake parts. Um, and then throughout the year, um, throughout the first semester, we're working on our, our air brake design. And then uh, beginning of, or at the end of this year, and then starting next semester is when we want to manufacture our air brakes. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Where in the flow last year did you realize that the nose cone was out of spec in terms of where it didn't fit? Yeah. For what point did you guys go, oh no? So that's something. We, we, we knew uh, pretty early on that it was undersized. We didn't expect it to be a problem. We thought that uh, we could um, kind of uh, retrofit, I guess, a bad dimension part into our rocket by uh, like using filler, epoxy uh, fiberglass filler to make the, um, like the shoulder and other parts a little bit wider so it fits better using shim tape to have it fit better in the body tube. So it was very, very early on, honestly, um, something that we should have realized. Um, but then, obviously, when the, uh, the rocket failed, then we kind of had a note to ourselves that this probably the issue. Do you have an interface control document or some kind of, like, specification that declares what the nose cone is? Um, we do have like SOLIDWORKS models that we're basing our molds off of, and um, okay. that's basically our, our main design. Uh, do you have time schedule to make more than one nose cone? Um, realistically, um, it can be done, yes. Uh, making a whole new nose cone mold is a little bit difficult. That takes a lot of time. Um, obviously, this year we have to start with first the, the MDF plug, and then we have to make two halves of a mold. It was the mold that was out of spec, yeah. So that's so making multiple copies on the crappy mold that was solved. Right, right. right. So it wasn't the, the layout. Right. Mold yeah. Um, so, and then a question on the air brakes. Uh, about 60 newtons and 200 mile an hour wind. What altitude is that? Um, density? That was at 30,000 feet. Yeah. That was the maximum. Uh, uh yeah uh we we expect to be able to to you know complete our flight albeit an uh, overshoot of our altitude so it'll fly yeah elaborate a little bit on that as well. Um, we are, I guess, an SRAD team on our motor, so if we know that the air brake system won't be ready in time for competition, uh, we can go ahead and adjust our motor so that we'll get closer to our apogee instead of overshooting like we're planning currently with the air brakes. Adjust your motor or you add some ballast? Uh, I guess it depends maybe what point we're at in the competition cycle. If it's early in the fall, we can adjust the motor and rerun all of our simulations. Um, but I guess if it's a little bit later on, we might have to look into adding ballast weight. 
Um, but we are making sure that we're staying underneath the maximum ceiling that ESRA allows in competition, uh, regardless of if the air brakes support or not. So you don't just space station? Yeah, so we're allowed to fly, honestly. <laughs> I yield my time. Any other questions? So, yeah. looking at this numerical analysis, FEM stuff, what sort of safety factors were you looking at? And we said aerodynamics towards the force would be this. Right. And what if they're off by a certain percentage? Um, so, actually, the, like the initial simulations that aerodynamics gave us provided a much lower force. And then uh, it was on the scale of like four pounds or something. And um, then we made some um, different like uh, assumptions and things in the aerodynamics uh, simulations to kind of raise the force value. Um, so this does have a, uh, a factor of safety already kind of um, built into this value. And then to elaborate again on that, the, I guess the force that caused um, the most like, critical deflections and stresses was actually the wind, and we had a factor of safety of three on that. Okay, and a lot of this analysis you talked about compression for obvious reasons. Right. But if the rocket's trying to banana itself, you're right. also tension on the other side. So where's all the, the same analysis for tension? Is that also done? Is um, it not mentioned? Or? We do plan on doing like a, a moment. Um, I know that it's not exactly like a tension analysis, but um, um, I think that's a, a more uh, maybe applicable analysis. Uh, the big thing is like at the time trade-off is we should do like the um, I guess the analyses that are most pertinent um, for now and if we do have more time then well especially when you talk about materials testing yeah in compression but what if that material is put under tension right like that's right a completely different yeah that's to yeah consider. that's definitely uh, I think that would be an easy uh, analysis to uh, have especially since we already did compression. Never curse yourself by saying that. <laughs> yeah. that. That is just guaranteed. To be. Uh, one last thing, you say the the time risk is minor. Uh, the impact would be minor. Um, Doesn't that depend what the time shortage makes you have to not get done, skip, etc.? Um, yeah. Could it potentially. Right. Well, if it's like rocket parts, um, I say the impact would be minor because it would just mean I'd have to bring the team in more times a week to, you know, work a little overtime to get more parts out. Um, obviously, you know, we're still going to be able to, you know, have the parts ready by test launch. It would just mean leading up to test launch, we'd have to put a lot more um, time in, like out of off hours. And then we also have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so Casey Ruckman asks, how, does the how do the drag brakes affect the stability of the vehicle? Would they significantly degrade the stability margin if they were to inadvertently deploy during boost? Um, for the air brakes? Yeah. Um, honestly, that might be a better question for aerodynamics. But uh, I know we pl uh, the, the placement is to um, bring the air brakes closest to the center of pressure. Um, for stability reasons. Um, and so that's what we did by placing the air brakes right above the coupler. Um, I don't think we've done any analyses on uh, stability, but that would be worthwhile to look into as well. Yeah, and then to elaborate on that as well, um, in our controls algorithm that we're creating, we're going to have, I guess, in the code that the air brakes cannot deploy uh, while the rocket is going over Mach 1. Um, so during the boost, that won't be an issue. We'll be going faster than that. Uh, Peter can elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'll talk about this in the avionics slides, but there are some pretty significant uh, mitigation plans within the software to prevent the airbridge from coming out anytime. And not even, a lot threshold is even lower than Mach 1, probably, but yeah, we have some so pretty significant uh, safeguards against that. Okay, and then we'll have one more question in the chat, and then we will move on from questions. Okay. And if anyone has any remaining questions, we can ask them uh, after the presentation. Uh, so Avi Rez asked, um, he says that you had a fab you said a fabrication error is believed to have led to the total loss of the vehicle last year. Uh, what is the justification of rating the risk impact of the fabrication error as only minor? 
Um, it wasn't as much a fabrication error as it was just a uh, bad engineering decision. Uh, we had an out of dimension mold or plug and we, we knew going into it it was out of dimension and we decided to go with it because we thought we could make it work. So it wasn't as much a fabrication error as it was um, just a, a bad decision, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah. And that's all the questions from the chat? Oh. I have another one. I heard you say center of pressure. Can you draw, show the chart that has the rocket in it? There. So, where are the brakes relative? And did you mean center of gravity? Um, so, from what I understand of aerodynamics is that the air brakes would deploy at center of pressure. Um, the air brakes will also, will also they'll actually bring the center of pressure closer to them when they are deployed. Uh, so our goal is to have the air brakes as far aft in the vehicle as possible. Um, and because of our aluminum motor too, we can't have them any further aft than above the coupler. Yeah, as far back as possible. Yeah, right. as far aft as possible. Where's the CG? I assume the air brakes don't come out until you burn the propellant. All the propellant's gone. Right. So where is the post burn CG relative to the air brakes? Um, that is something I am not sure of. Uh, what would happen if the air brakes were up north of the, let's say the CG was left of the air brakes? Yeah, so in our open and rocket models, back end come out around you, right? in the open rocket models, our center of gravity is forward. Do you know how far? Uh, I don't have the exact number. I can pull that up after the presentation, actually, and we can look at the model if you would like. As long as it's to the right, I'm, yeah. I'm happier than if you told me. Yeah, it's farther forward. It's an air And just a follow-up question to your previous answer about the mold and yeah. the risk concern. So what is the process that lets you decide, we think we can go ahead with a known bad mold, and what have we changed so that similar issues can't crop up this year? Um, we, I think we just never ran into um, an issue like a structural failure such as we had last year. It was just not something we were kind of anticipating. Um, so going with the out of dimension mold, um, we just, uh, I guess, didn't. Uh, but you make the mold, right? Right. All molds are out of dimension. The question is how much? So what are, what are the rules? What are the specs? Who makes the decision? Go, no, go. We can use this mold or we have to spend the time to remake. Um, that's a good question. I think that, um, so the, the mold, the previous year mold, um, it was like the, the out of dimension, it, it was significant. Um, so much th so that you could, you could like definitely see it. Um, uh, so None of those terms have numbers attached. I know. Your well, is significant <laughs> and hers and his could all be different. So what is the process within the team? If, if you don't have one now, that's fine. Right. Come up with one before you face the issue. Right. Of this is how we're going to decide what's good enough or not. Right. So one sub team can't make everyone else's work for not. Right. Yeah, I think and I'm not blaming you if you're the one standing over by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Murak mentioned a specification document for the team earlier, and I think that should be something that we look into. And we will keep that in mind and come up with a little bit better numbers than I think we've used in the past, which um, I guess thank you for bringing it up, and we'll be sure to do that. And I think we are also out of time for questions. Oh, Alex. Can I ask a question? Quick one. Uh, well, we both all, both have six-inch uh, body tubes, and I've been working with Ryan uh, to design the uh, the nose cone plug that we'll use for both teams to make sure it, it works for both teams. Uh, but I don't foresee any issues since we'll both have six-inch uh, body tubes. Good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Sawyer with aerodynamics. <laughs>
All right, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Sawyer Haman, and I am this year's aerodynamics lead. Uh, so our project purpose is um, approximate the drag on the rocket uh, through CFD, computational fluid dynamic simulations, um, assist in accurately predicting the rocket's apogee, and uh, enhancing and teaching our current and newer members uh, understanding of fluid dynamics and CFD. System requirements. Um, Really, we don't have any specific ones laid out by Ezra, but what we do is um, analyze the drag characteristics of rocket aerodynamic components, uh, recommend geometry changes to minimize drag and ensure stability, develop an accurate drag coefficient database to be used by the air brake control system and apogee prediction, accurately predict the apogee of the rocket, and uh, verify our computational results with some uh, wind tunnel testing. <clears throat> So our design process, um, we want to improve and use the team's ability to obtain uh, drag characteristics of the rocket using CFD. Uh, we use ANSYS Fluence. We want to determine drag coefficient estimates for all flight regimes during ascents. Uh, verify these results with some low speed uh, wind tunnel testing and some hand calculations. Uh, give our data to our our uh, air brakes control team and uh, use our drag coefficients in an apogee prediction model. <clears throat> so system overview of uh, kind of what we do. Uh, really we start, we have a, might be a little difficult to see, we have um, a quarter body of our rocket modeled there. Uh, we just do a quarter body to sort of decrease our uh, computational load. Um, we have our computational domain, uh, sort of that quarter cylinder around our rocket. Um, and then we have to create a mesh of that domain. Um, we try to maximize cell sizes to uh, also decrease how long our simulations will take, uh, but without sacrificing um, accuracy on our end data. <clears throat> uh, once we have our mesh, we will run the fluent solver after we input our flight conditions. Uh, we want to, again, minimize computational load without sacrificing accuracy. Uh, we can do this through a couple ways, uh, different turbulence models and wall functions. Uh, these are just some sort of, these are just sort of uh, convergence graphs, really. Um, and then uh, after the solver is run, we'll analyze and record our results. Uh, these are just some pressure contours of, I think it was, uh, the rocket at about Mach 0.5. Um, not really important, but they look good for the presentation. Uh, really, we're looking at our drag coefficient values. <clears throat> um, and then after we get some results, we will want to verify our computational methods with wind tunnel testing. Um, the plan right now is to have a scaled down 3D printed model of the rocket uh, and use that on a load cell. Um, we have gotten in contact with uh, someone who helps with the Bulls Hall wind tunnel. Um, so our plan right now is to utilize that at some point. And um, in the CDME, uh, we have a Prusa 3D printer. Um, we may use that or explore other options. <clears throat> Just some preliminary results we've gotten this year. Um, really what we're doing is analyzing the drag characteristics with regards to our air brake system. Um, we, uh, we full air brake deployment at post motor burn subsonic ascent. Um, it seems to about double the drag coefficient of the rocket, so that's good. Um, it seems to be quite effective. Um, and then our plan is to gather drag coefficients at different 25% increments of the air brake deployed um, at uh, all speeds that it would be deployed at. Um, and so there is just some data. Um, drag coefficient at zero deployment, so just the rocket really without any air brake, um, is about 0 0.29 it seems. This is uh, at, this is about an average value of our um, subsonic uh, post burn ascent. And then with the air brake fully deployed about 0 0.56. Uh, so some risks to our project success, errors from mesh meshing inaccuracies. Um, it is a little difficult to get a mesh that 100% uh, uh, encapsulates 
uh, real life data. Um, so that is something we'll need to think about during our uh, testing. Over an underestimation of drag, um, if we poorly estimate our drag coefficient values, um, this may lead to a poor deployment of our air brake system uh, and a bad estimate of our apogee. Wind tunnel testing access restrictions. Um, if we cannot uh, verify our computational results, um, it is also uh, could be bad with our, uh, our drag coefficients and then a time shortage. So we've got a risk matrix here. Um, at the top, errors for meshing inaccuracies. Um, we've got a couple ways to work on this with uh, using our Y plus values, different mesh convergence studies. Um, it is possible um, and the uh, impact would be significant. Um, over an underestimation of drag, uh, we can use our wind tunnel testing again to verify our computational results. Uh, we can do some basic hand calculations and then uh, test different flight speeds and compare to open, open rocket results. Um, this is uh, a little more, it's, it is possible. Um, I don't know how we would get, we're going to try to, but uh, like exactly perfect real life results from our CFD simulations. Um, and it could be a major issue uh, for our air brake system. Wind tunnel testing access restrictions. Uh, likelihood is uh, probably likely, um, but we are we have already worked on contacting faculty early, so uh, impact I think will be minor. And then time shortage, uh, likelihood rare, uh, impact minor. Um, we're already getting a lot done. I think we have a lot of time in, left in the year to, uh, if we need to go back and change something to go ahead and do that. Uh, just uh, schedule for the rest of the year. Um, through October and November, we've been working on teaching our teams ANSYS Fluent. Um, we'll, we'll probably be doing that for a lot of the year, uh, or at least learning more and improving, but um, learning a lot of basics in these first few months. Uh, develop post-motor burnout subsonic drag coefficient database. Uh, we've been working on that now. We will continue to um, until we finish it, really. Verify computational results with low-speed wind tunnel testing. Uh, we've gotten in contact with someone who can help us with that. Um, we'd like to start at least in November, um, and then we'll run that until we've also finished our uh, drag coefficient database. Um, determine drag coefficient estimates of rocket for all flight regimes, so not just our uh, in our air brake deployment time frame, also our um, our supersonic uh, drag coefficients. Uh, we'd like to get that done before our first test flight. Um, accurate altitude calculations. This will be after we've uh, collected all of our data, um, and then through the rest of the time up until our uh, competition. And then uh, use flight test flight data to verify our models and calculations. Um, that'll be around after we've had our uh, cup test flights. All right, uh, I'll open up to questions now. <coughs> there's currently no questions in the chat, but there's a slight delay, so we'll just give it uh, okay. a couple seconds. Yeah. Nothing. All right. Sounds good. Uh, I'll pass it off to Propulsion and Advaith. So, oh. Back to the drag oh, yes. So, can you talk to me a little bit about how you test as you fly the uh, um, drag coefficient? Like, what's the drag coefficient you're looking at? Like, or just, just what drag force is going to be on the rocket? Yeah, it's, it's a function of um, I guess just, uh, Density and the square velocity. yeah. So can you talk to me about when you say for all flight regimes, you got, you got three things you're looking at, right? Your flight regimes, the drag, not the coefficient, but ultimately you're going to want to know how much drag you can put on the rock. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's a function of the CV 
but it's also a function of the row and a function of v squared and what the row is given the v that you're at at the altitude you're at. So can you talk to me about how you walk through that? Oh, right, yes. Um, so uh, really how we do it is um, first uh, we'll run a, an open rocket simulation of the test flight um, and that'll give us a lot of um, it gives us a lot of data, including like uh, density, pressure, temperature, um, at different altitudes and speeds we are pretty much through the entire launch. Um, and then we'll, we'll use that data um, in our CFD simulations to get a uh, drag coefficient. And then we actually did get 1.5 in the chat. Uh, so Zach Parker asked if you could talk a little bit more about the CFD that you conducted to determine the force on the air brakes. Oh, uh, yes. Um, this was at the very beginning of the year. It was um, pretty preliminary. Um, I don't think I have any good images that would represent it. Um, but I uh, ran a simulation of our rocket at um, about Mach 0 0.8, which was probably the fastest we would want to deploy at, um, and then just analyzed the downward force, uh, total downward force on the air brake from that simulation. Um, yeah. Thank you. And that is all the questions from the chat. All right. Yes, Dr. Ritchie. So you've got your air brakes. Let's say you have a very accurate set of uh, drag coefficients. Um, how is the control system that's running this, is it doing any feedback? Is it pre-programmed? <clears throat> what is it trying to read, to know, to do this? What are we trying to manage? Um, so uh, I'm not involved a lot in the coding, but I'm pretty sure um, it's um, pretty much it is reading at the moment. Uh, we're getting live data of our velocity, uh, pressure, and temperature. Um, it uses those. Um, and it determines, um, using some equations, what drag coefficient the rocket would need to hit from where it is exactly around 30,000 feet. <clears throat> and I'll talk about this in more detail yeah. on these kind of slides. Yeah, and my point is, how accurate do you really need your drag coefficients to be, or is the control system going to say, well, the velocity is still too high, deploy more, or sort of Right, I mean, how, how dependent is what you're doing on the numbers he generates? So, uh, just thank to you. be quick about it, ideally not very dependent. So we want to design our system to be able to adjust based on what's uh, basically just we, we you know, supply some in, input, we actually theater breaks a certain amount, and we can on the fly see what happens and go based off that, at least for a significant portion of it. So on our end, we're hoping to design it in a way that is Obviously, we need some information about the drag coefficients, but ideally, we're as resilient to inaccuracies as possible. Okay, so now coming back to your stuff, uh, you talked about doing some low speed wind tunnel tests. Mm -hmm. That's the wind tunnel we have. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to validate what your computer are high speed drag coefficients, right? Uh, drag yes. coefficient is a function of Reynolds number. So even if we measure it perfectly in our wind tunnel, is that gonna be a helpful result? I mean, you can validate that your low speed sim matches low speed experiments, doesn't need a high speed experiment would match your high speed simulation, right? Yes. Uh, we're still sort of exploring different options uh, for what we can do to validate our models, but um, I've, the plan right now is to, once we have gathered all, like our, or at least our low speed drag coefficients, um, verify some of those models using um, sort of like similar inputs. We'll run new simulations um, with similar inputs that would be in like Bulls Hall by the wind tunnel um, and see if our results would match that and using the same other, methods. And this is just a comment you expressed some concerns, we want to minimize computational time, reduce the mass. You can also get a virtually free Ohio Super computer center account and do this with a very fine mesh if you're worried about the mesh not being fine enough to capture what's going on. Yeah, I um, earlier in the year I looked into the... I'm not saying you should. Okay. I'm just okay. pointing out that is path B, is go there and just up the mesh to whatever you think you need it to be to resolve mm. the flow around your air brakes. 
that would be good, yeah. Because as a student team, right, they have social accounts you can get, so it's not an expense. Sweet. All right. Now I'll I'll pass it off to Advaith on pr the propulsion team. <clears throat> All right. Hi everyone. My name is Advaith Saraf. I'm the propulsion lead this year for Space Forward America at BSLI. So a little bit about propulsion and what we do. Um, the main goal of propulsion in the year is just to design, uh, test, and um, kind of just learn about the process of a solid rocket motor system that propels the rocket to 30,000 feet. What we try to do throughout the whole year is give students hands-on experience with propulsion, propulsion testing, and motor manufacturing. Um, essentially, anything related to propulsion, we strive to learn. So we follow, propulsion follows a lot of requirements throughout the year that keeps us in check. Um, most of them are given to us by Ezra um, and the hard rules that we have to follow. And, but some of them kind of vary year to year and these are specific team requirements that are based on our goals for the year. So some of the main Ezra requirements that we follow are um, essentially the whole motor and propulsion system has to be entirely student researched and designed. Um, for this design, we need to have a motor simulation file um, that's completely documented. We use an application called BurnSim where we, where we visualize and model our motor throughout the entire year. Um, aside from this, we also have to document everything else that we do related to propulsion. Uh, this can be from changes to the propellant formula, um, all the testing that we do and all the test results, such as hydrostatic testing and static testing, um, and much more. Uh, there's also quantitative rules that we have to follow, such as keeping the apogee between 30,000 to 34,000 feet, which is the maximum limit. And this is without air brakes, um, in case, uh, just it, like this is like worst case scenario if we do not use them. Um, we do all of our simulations for 34,000 feet max without air brakes. Um, one, of the all, one of the rules that we're also following right now, um, we're actively working on, is keeping the rail velocity above 100 feet per second. This is one of the rules given to us by uh, one of the Ezra rules, and we're actively working on it. Aside from that, there are a few other rules that we have put ourselves for the team and that we're trying to work on. Uh, mainly, we try to keep the pressure um, between 500 to 1,000 PSI. This is based on uh, previous years of propulsion, um, based on what we know and what has worked for us. Last year, the motor um, was fine, and we didn't have any issues with it. So this is sort of based off of last year. It's enough to keep the thrust high enough, uh, the thrust high enough to get us to 30,000 feet apogee, and the pressure um, low enough at the point where it's stable and we don't suffer from any instability. So once we outline these uh, system requirements, we go along to our design process. So propulsion has kind of an iterative design process throughout the entire year. Um, we spend the first few months initially going through motor research and conducting motor research. So this goes varies from looking at last year, referencing files from previous years, um, looking at the test data from all the static fire testing we did in previous years, and looking at the competition data. This gives us a nice visualization of where we stand at at the start of the year and where we can continue. Um, since we worked so hard on the propellant formula over the years, uh, the goal for this year is to keep it similar to last year. Um, the propellant formula it has been good and we haven't had issues with it and we make adjustments as needed. Um, as we do more motor simulation, we can see if we need to make any changes to get more impulse or less impulse and so on. Um, propulsion uses a lot of software. We do a lot of simulation throughout the entire year before we start assembling the motor ourselves. So we use BurnSim, which is the main application that we model the motor system. BurnSim is really helpful, um, as you can see on the top right. On that picture, that's a nice little screenshot of burn sim, where it has info on burn time, impulse, thrust curves, ISP, nozzle, grain dimensions, and total pressure. So all of these are important values to know um, when we're calculating and seeing if the motor is good enough, uh, good for us to reach our targeted apogee. Once we have a motor that is designed, we input this into another application called Open Rocket, where it gives us our estimated apogee, rail velocity, stability, flight time, and more. 
Both of these applications go hand in hand, and we use both of them throughout the year in order to model the whole system. Um, we can, for burn sand specifically, we can change the grains, uh, like the amount of like propellant we have in it, the grain dimensions. Um, we can change like the motor motor casing, the total length, and all of this is just very helpful to see the finalized motor system. Once we have our simulations uh, set throughout the first semester, uh, at the start of the second semester, we start going on to our physical testing. So this is usually consists of static fire testing, where we get all of our propellant and put it into the motor casing, and we static fire test it to see if it's good enough for us to take to New Mexico for the competition. Um, this static fire testing is good for us because we connect, we get thrust values and pressure values that tell us um, if that's what we're looking for. Uh, Sometimes if it's too low, we'll have to do a second static fire test by doing some tweaks to the Burnson file and then, or maybe even propellant formula. And this way we can see if our motor is finalized before the competition. So now that we're in October, we've gone through the design process um, or we started going through it and we've arrived at our preliminary motor concept. This is pretty similar to last year. Um, as I said previously, the motor itself last year during the competition was fine. So just like last year, it is a class O motor with around 24,000 newton seconds of impulse. The max thrust is 5,000 newtons. Uh, the max pressure is 570 PSI and the burn time is 5.9 seconds. Um, using burn sim and open rockets, this gives us an estimated apogee of a little bit under 34,000 feet, which is the ceiling. And the rail velocity is 90 feet per second. Um, as I also stated previously, we need to get that rail velocity at 100 feet per second. As a result, both of these are expected to change as we're still going through iterations. Uh, we've only barely touched burn sim and started working with it, so we got a lot more work to be done. Um, as for the physical dimensions of the motor itself, uh, we are keeping the same four inch diameter as last year. We made that change last year to help allow for a little bit more propellant and that worked perfectly, so we are keeping that. Last year, we had a 60, 60 inch propellant um, layout and we had 50 inches of propellant. So we had a 10 inch aluminum spacer and 50 inches of propellant. So this year, um, in order to account for like weight issues, uh, since the weight is a little bit higher because of the air brakes, we wanna keep this lightweight. So we are reducing 50 inches of propellant to 48 inches. This is just for now, this is preliminary. Um, it gave us an estimated apogee of uh, a little bit under 34,000 feet, so it could work, but we still have a lot more testing to be done. Um, we could end up raising that number and get more than 48 inches of propellant or add, a, add an aluminum spacer like last year. So there is just a lot more testing that needs to be done. As for the hardware itself, propulsion uses a lot of different components involved with the motor system. Uh, mainly we have the motor case that I talked about earlier. Um, it's a four inch outside diameter just like last year and it's an aluminum tube that has the other components. And in order to kind of fit the other components that will go in it, it's around 4.5 inches longer than um, the propellant stack itself. So this year it would be a little bit under 53 inches. Some of the other components that it, that it needs to allow for, that's why we have the motor case bigger, is uh, the forward closure. That's the structure that seals um, the end of the case and it attaches the propellant propulsion system to the rocket. We also have O-rings and retaining rings used for sealing purposes, and they're made of rubber and steel. Um, also, these are, we, we are not gonna be reusing any of these from last year. Um, even though the motor system was intact, we're ordering a new motor case, we're getting a new forward closure, um, and basically just new everything. Especially, so now on this slide you can see we have nozzle. Um, it accelerates the flow of pro propellants to increase the thrust of the motor, and we get these from burn some calculations. So this kind of varies year to year. Um, the nice thing about open about burn sim is um, it kind of optimizes your nozzle. It tells you the best nozzle dimensions that you can use. So this kind of changes year to year and we'll get this manufactured for whatever we want to use this year. And as I talked about earlier, we have our grains. This is kind of the propellant goes inside the grains and this is, um, it acts like the combustion chamber. This is what gets the rocket in the air. Um, the main type of propellant we, or the only type of propellant we use is ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, or APCP for short. Um, that is the main, that's the mixture of uh, oxidizer and um, a binding agent, and that is what goes into the grains. 
So as with any pr propulsion system and motor system, there's a lot of risks that come with it. Uh, the main one is Cato, where the motor system uh, ends up exploding. Um, this can be a pretty severe, or this will be a very severe impact if it happens, but it, is, it could be very minimized and mitigated if we conduct static fire tests to ensure propellant stability. Um, essentially, this could happen if the propellant formula isn't good enough or we use the wrong chemicals in it and it ends up being unstable and blowing up. Um, however, th there's a, that's a very low chance of happening. There's also the chance of structural failure for the motor casing and the entire motor system itself. This can happen because the material that we used wasn't good enough or wasn't assembled properly. Maybe the forward closure didn't fit on properly with the motor tube. Um, however, this year we are conducting our first hydrostatic test. Um, we are aiming to conduct the first hydrostatic test, and this can help ensure the strength of the motor casing when subject to high pressure. Um, usually for the hydrostatic test, we're still in the preliminary stages, but we were thinking of 1.5 times the maximum pressure that the motor may be subject to. Um, and doing this will help show that the motor system is, has structural stability. On top of that, there is the risk of a shuffed slash failed ignition. Um, this is simply can happen because you don't put the igniter in correctly, but by practice, practicing proper placement and making sure that all team members know exactly how the igniter goes inside the motor and reviewing testing procedures, they can be, this can be very mitigated. On top of that, one of the main issues that pr propulsion faces is the inability to reach a target apogee. So this can be either undershooting or overshooting the 30,000 to 34,000 range. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, two years ago we suffered um, the problem of not being high enough. Our apogee wasn't high enough to get us to the 30,000 feet ceiling. Um, we did some like evaluations and review of that and it wasn't because of the motor, it's, it, motor itself, it wasn't like like a pr propellant issue or anything, but it was mainly because um, we just didn't have enough impulse on it, so we just needed to add more propellant in it. That's why we raised the diameter of it to four millimeters, um, or sorry, four inches, uh, which was different than last year, it was 98 millimeters. Um, so also by doing extensive simulation with BurnSim and Open Rocket. We're able to see what our target apogee is, um, and this will help us a lot in order for us to finalize our motor design. So now on to the risk matrix. Um, I kind of already talked about everything uh, here. Um, as I stated earlier, Cato and high pressure structural failure would be very severe because the motor just it would just explode. But um, this is pretty rare, especially because all the testing that we go through. It's already October. Uh, or it's only October and we've already done a lot of testing and we still have so many more months left. So um, by the New Mexico, Mexico competition, we'll have a lot of testing undergone. Uh, we'll have a static fire test and we're doing our first hydrostatic test to help minimize those. Um, a shove slash failed ignition is pretty minor. Um, we can always just get another igniter uh, if, if it just doesn't work. But we'll go over with the whole team and make sure everyone knows static testing procedures and how like proper procedures at the competition and also for the inability to reach um, targeted apogee that is pretty significant because for space War in america we want it to be within 30,000 to 34,000 but we've already started working on our burn some simulations early so um, by may by june we'll have our finalized motor and it'll be good to go so Propulsion throughout the year follows a pretty similar schedule. Um, there's a lot of stuff to learn about, a lot of things to do. So we start off at the beginning of the semester researching improvements from last year. We look at what needs to be changed, what if anything went wrong at the competition. We look at the static fire that we do. And um, once we start doing that, once all the members kind of gain an understanding for propulsion, we go into our preliminary simulations where we start doing our initial burn sim and open rocket um, change everything for last year, especially because the weights will be different. There's always stuff to do. Uh, as the semester starts kind of closing down, this is kind of where we're at right now. We start getting ready for static testing, um, which would be in the second semester. So we calibrate the load cell that we use um, for static testing purposes. We verify the pressure transducer functionality, um, check the data acquisition system, make sure everything's good if we need to order anything. Um, also this year's as I said earlier, um, we're doing our first hydrostatic test. So right now we're also in the process of 
preparing for it. Um, hopefully we could have it done um, early second semester. Uh, right now I'm consulting with the Liquids team and they're helping me out. They have a lot of data acquisition um, equipment and they have extra like connections and wiring that we can use for our hydrostatic test. Um, and also I'm just, we're doing an inventory check and seeing if I need to order necessary equipment. And we're also writing a procedure because it's our first time doing it. Aside from that, as the second semester starts rolling around, we start preparing for static fire testing. So we finalize our motor design. We make sure that it's good to go um, for us to take it out to the field in Dayton. We mix the motors. Uh, we work with a mentor that helps us mix our motors. And we static fire our motors. And we also try to get all of the propulsion members certified um, by the Tripoli Rocketry Association, especially for motor mixing purposes. Um, hopefully they're level one, and if they can, level two. And by the end of the semester, we'll have our competition motor finalized. So this includes all the propellant, um, the entire like casing, all the components that we need for the propulsion, propulsion system itself. So that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Hey, you have a few questions in the chat waiting for you. Uh, so Casey Ruckman asks, how does the KN value look? Are you keeping similar grain grain stepping slash inner diameters for the shorter core length? Wait, can you repeat the second part of that question? Yeah, sorry, I stopped a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so Casey asked, how does the KN value look? Are you keeping similar grain stepping on inner diameters for the shorter core length? Yeah, so we're keeping, um, the, for the grains, we're keeping all the dimensions the same because last year it looked like the motor system was fine. We had no issues with it. Um, I don't think it would be good to change any of the grain dimensions. It's what we used before and it will be good. We're working on changing the length though, but not the core diameter. Um, changing the diameter won't help us, but we can, we're can. we working on changing the stack itself. And for the KN, I don't know the value off the top of my head. We're still preliminary in our simulations, but um, I can find that at the end of the presentation on Open Rocket. All right, and then you kind of answered this question while you are talking for the previous question, but Casey also asked, how did the motor look after last year's flight? Uh, obviously, there was crash damage, but did the motor appear to get to burn out nominally? Yeah, so um, the motor system itself after the competition last year was honestly pretty fine. We were able to recover it, and we have it at the CDME right now. Um, as for the casing, obviously we're changing like the length of the motor, so we're ordering a new one. Um, we recovered the forward closure. Uh, we're not reusing that. Um, we need to have a separate one manufactured for the competition, but we can reuse that forward closure for testing purposes for hydrostatic or static fire testing. And then Noah asked, he says, in past years, the results from the open rocket and burn some softwares have varied somewhat significantly from the competition results. How do you plan on accounting and repairing for that variation? Yeah, so in past years, um, the open rocket file usually overshot the estimated apogee by around 20%. But this year, we have the new addition of the air brakes, which kind of helps a lot um, in order to, to keep it at a lower apogee. Uh, therefore, we're not accounting for that 20%. We're going to maybe, I'm still thinking about it for now, but um, it's going to be much lower, maybe like a 5% overshoot. So instead of going for like, Last year, I think we had like over 40,000 estimated, uh, 40,000 feet estimated apogee. This year, we'll go for like 35,000 for now, uh, just because the air brakes will help. Uh, to elaborate on that a little bit, we did get down from the 40,000 estimate for the yeah. competition. That was, I think, under CBR last year. Yeah. Um, and we have, we'll be simulating the 34,000 mm -hmm. uh, for the judges. Yeah. Great. And then you have uh, another question. So this one's from Zach Parker. Will you be making any custom motor hardware this year, or will you be making a custom space here to account for the extra room in the tube? And are you using threaded closures or switching back to snap rings? You kind of already went over this, but just to reiterate. Yeah, um, we're using threaded closures. Um, and we don't need a spacer this year because we don't have extra room. Um, we have 48 inches of propellant and the case. And, uh, and then we have the forward closure. So the case itself is only around 52, 52.5. Um, so we won't, for now, preliminary, we won't be using a motor spacer. But that is subject to change. Great. And then as far as custom motor hardware goes, we will be having that uh, supply. Um, and then you have a question from Ryan. Uh, are there any concerns with performing a static fire in the winter when the launch will be in the summer, uh, i.e. the temperature difference may cause different current performances? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I honestly haven't given too much thought to that. That is definitely something we need to look into. Usually we do our static fire testing in February, March, or maybe around March when it's temperatures start getting a little higher. But that's, that's definitely something to look into, especially because New Mexico and Ohio are very different. Great, and that's all the questions from the chat. Cool. Any Ask whose job it is to remember to bring the retaining rings, or is that for the other team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, probably my job this year, yeah. Don't forget. I will not. You'll have to go to like some high school and get the retaining Okay. <laughs> I'll write that down. Okay. You got a question back? Uh, the weight of the weight increase back from the air brakes, you are expecting the motor to be a bit bigger this year. You said like the motor will be bigger or? I would presume that the motor would have to be have to a little bit more impulse. Yeah. It's still preliminary. Um, the thing about having a heavier, like, air brakes adding to the weight is it also gives us more inertia. Um, so at some point, we have a lot of inertia where we go over the estimated apogee. So we're still working on finding that sweet spot um, for the motor weight itself. And yeah, also the question for those who didn't hear in the live stream was if we're just changing the weight of the motor and what our simulations look like. And then to elaborate on that as well, last year we had a pretty significantly larger motor case than we needed. Um, I believe that was close to 60, 60 inches. inches. Um, and this year we're planning to cut that down pretty significantly. And we also had an aluminum uh, plug in the motor to make up for the extra space that was there that the grains were taking up. So that is cutting down our weight uh, pretty significantly to help it be a little bit closer to last year's. Mm -hmm. So the one thing. Uh, I think I would expect a little more discussion about is safety mm. in your section compared to everyone else's. So you mentioned you're going to do a hydrostatic test 1.5 times pressure. Is that industry standard? Have you checked to see what standard? Yeah, that That's useful information to have. Uh, and also just talking about safety protocols, right? You have O-rings. In the world of rocket motors, O-rings can have a bad reputation. So, you know, do you have things like we'll never use it below this temperature, as related to a previous discussion? Right? There are definite safety concerns that you need to have plans where you don't have to discuss the whole plan at a PDR, but mentioning that you have plans for those things would be helpful. Yeah. So the question was um, about our safety procedures and if we have any written out. Um, we're still in the process of writing them out. We'll definitely have them by the CDR um, once you start getting to the static testing point. Um, as for the hydrostatic test, I, I started doing some research online and it's kind of hard to find stuff on it, but I found 1.5 times. That was based on last year when we first started talking about it. Um, that's the number we threw out and what I saw in like YouTube videos online, but that is subject to change once I start doing more research. We're planning on working with our liquids team, the liquids team at BSLI, on that hydrostatic test, and we'll work with them to come up with some safety procedures um, just to make sure that we do keep everyone safe when we're loading up an aluminum tube with much pressure. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then there's one more question in the chat. Yeah, Lauren, I think Lauren. Um, so you said you're predicting around 35,000 feet from burns and then air is usually around. Actually, expected to go up about 28,000 feet under 30,000. Yeah. So, how, can you clarify a little bit more how you're expecting to balance everything with the air brakes, the predicted apogee, and the ceiling that you're allowed to predict? Mm -hmm. So, the question was um, about the estimated apogee and if it's still 1 point or still 20% higher than it used to be. Um, that was the case in previous years, but I don't think that will be the case this year. Um, we're not going with that 20% anymore because we have the air brakes to account for um, the increase in apogee. But well, what if your air brakes fail? Um, if, well, we also have a smaller, we have less propellant, so I think it'll, it wouldn't overshoot the apogee, but we should, yeah, we should do simulations for both, one with the air brakes and one without. 
Yeah, so if the air brakes were to fail, um, we talked about the ceiling of 34,000 a little bit, I guess a couple of times throughout the presentation. Um, that is an overshoot because open rocket and burn sim aren't exactly accurate when you're on supersonic flight. It's typically off by a couple of thousand there. Uh, so we would expect that just from past results, we need some numbers to back this up this year. Um, but we would expect that Apogee to be closer to 32,000, um, which isn't terribly far off from our goal. It would not be ideal if they were to fail, but we do want to give them a chance to be able to deploy. What if they fail the other way? So they instantly pop out when they're not supposed to and stay on the entire flight. What happens? Well, then, yeah, at that point, it's like point of no return. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not too sure about that, but we should definitely look into all the possible like things that could happen in regards to the airbrakes. Yeah, we just want to know if there's a safety concern, right? Because there's a big difference in, as we talked about, center of gravity and things yeah. after burnout and before. So if, heaven forbid, something goes horribly wrong and they just pop out right away, mm -hmm. do we I all think need Peter. to go diving into a hole somewhere? <laughs> Good things to know. Just yeah, to, definitely. Just in case. Peter would talk a little bit more about the actual controls uh, in this section and the fail saves that we have for that. Um, we have one time for one more question, um, and then we'll have to wrap this up due to time constraints. Uh, but Casey asked, for static testing, are you all still using the same TC logger DAC, or are you working with liquids to use their NI? Have you verified that your load cell and pressure transducer are calibrated? Um, yeah, so we're using the same TC logger uh, from last year. And we have just started our preliminary look at the load cell and pressure transducer and making sure they're good. We took them out last week, but we were working on the burn sim. We didn't have time to do those. But that's at the next meeting, we'll definitely be like seeing if we can calibrate it and seeing if every all the plugs work and everything. Yeah. That's all for One more question, or uh, we'll keep it for that. Keep it for that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hello, I am Peter Hall, the avionics lead. Uh, so I'll be talking about the electrical systems in the rocket. So real quickly, the project purpose is to design the uh, majority SRAD flight critical electrical and software systems within the rocket. So payload has electronics as well, but those are sort of distinct from the rest of the rocket, uh, specifically with the goal of managing the recovery, tracking, and the control of the air brakes. We also like to expose our members to sort of skills or tools that are very important in industry, but not really taught in class, as well as developing, particularly this year, especially rigorous testing and validation procedures, given how much SRAD hardware we are hoping to fly. Uh, so some system requirements. The first two are the most important ones, that is to eject the nose cone and deploy the drug parachute at Apogee. So when I say eject, uh, recovery is hand handling the actual ejection. We are just sending them an electrical signal once we detect we're at that point, and then the rest is handled by recovery. And then again, deploy the main parachute at 1,500 feet. We also are required to track the rocket's GPS position so we can recover it, uh, and we'll be transmitting that to our ground control. We're going to be tracking a lot of other values and uh, figures as well. Uh, those are sort of optional, and they're not required to be tracked. New this year, we are controlling the actuation of the air brakes uh, to ensure the apogee is within 1% of 30,000 feet. That 1% value is a self set goal, it's sort of the balance between what will help us score well, but also what is fairly achievable, we think, in our first year. And then also we hope to record flight video. Uh, so again, for the design process, we're focusing on a fully SRAD, or as far as the rules will allow, SRAD design uh, is also highly professional. At the same time, we want to educate and train our team members. So that's been what we've been doing a lot so far. We fortunately have a very large sub-team this year, so there's been a lot, a lot of time spent on getting new members up to speed. Um, and then we also are carefully exploring all the different constraints we're working with uh, to decide what's the best option. So usually when we're solving a problem, we're looking at a number of different solutions to see which one will uh, serve it best. In terms of our, sort of our, time, our timeline, uh, at a broad level, the fall semester is mainly focused on the research and development, and then the spring we'll be testing and making any small tweaks if needed. So like I mentioned, we have a very large sub-team this year. So we've decided to, internally, we have like six different groups working on different components of our system. So let's go over them real quick. Uh, we 
this title we use is responsible engineer, so that's someone who is responsible or has ownership over a specific portion of the system. So we have Dylan Williams leading the mechanical development. I'm leading the digital and the RF electronics. Uh, Pranav Mula and Celine Sahara are leading the power electronics. Dursu Gorski with the flight software. Toby Simpson with the guidance navigation and control. That's the air brakes. And then Lauren Klar with the ground control software. And I just want to reiterate that while I may be the one presenting this, these people are absolutely essential to what we do on avionics, and we could not do it without them. So to give the system overview real quick, so we have our diagram here. It's a little bit complicated or overwhelming. I'll be going over each individual thing in detail. Uh, in a minute, starting on the left, though, we have our telemetry and our tracking system. So we have two tracking methods. We have a COTS, or commercial off-the-shelf one, and we have an SR1. And both of those are interfacing via two different radios and going into uh, display softwares on computers. Uh, so this section on the left here is on the ground. Well, this is on the ground. And this will be within the rocket. The center of a lot of the work we're doing is the SRAD flight computer. So that is controlling the SRAD radio. Again, I'll talk about these in a minute to elaborate on what those are. Uh, but it's also connecting to the camera and, of course, the recovery system. Uh, we also have a COTS flight computer, which is, as you can tell, completely electrically isolated from all the SRAD circuitry. So if any of our designs uh, do happen to fail, that should be isolated from that failure. Um, and yeah, so I'll now transition over to discuss each one of these in more detail to explain what's going on. So starting with the mechanical system to give context for where all of these electronics are going. So a majority of them are housed within what we call the avionics space. So this is within the coupler. I'll show a picture in a minute. Um, but this is where most of our SRI circuitry is going to be. The COTS flight computer and the barometer for the SRI flight computer, which is actually separate from the rest of the flight computer, are located above the payload. And this is because we aerodynamics ran some pressure simulations for us, and the air brakes caused a pretty significant decrease in pressure beneath them. Um, and so having our electronics there would have been a problem, or having the barometers there would have been a problem as we use barometric pressure as one of our main uh, methods of determining altitude. So we have those uh, much further up in the rocket where they're isolated from that behavior. Uh, the antennas for our system are within the, well, they're connected to the avionics bay, but they are within the fiberglass transition piece. Uh, and this is because aluminum and also carbon fiber significantly attenuate any radio signals, so we cannot transmit through them. And the avionics mechanical bay is uh, primarily machined from 6061 aluminum. We'll be starting that next week. Uh, so I've got three different pictures here. So on the left, we have the assembled avionics bay. So uh, this is the actual part of the air brakes up here. We have just a stack of circuit boards on top of a battery, essentially sandwiched between two uh, aluminum bulkheads. In the middle, I've got a diagram showing what each of those circuit boards are. So at the, beneath the top bulkhead, we have an, what we call the input-output board. This doesn't have any active functionality. It just is really there to help us clean up our wiring. So rather than having a ton of loose cables within here, we can route, that, route them on that printed circuit board. Beneath that, we have the SRAD flight computer. Uh, beneath that, we have our SRAD radio, and then a power board to distribute and regulate power for these systems. Uh, and then, of course, the battery beneath that. These boards are uh, stacked together with these board-to-board -board connectors, so each one can transmit either communications or power to the other ones, um, allowing them, them to all stay in sync in a reliable manner. Um, so to give the context in terms of the larger rockets, so the large item you see in the middle is the payload systems bay. Corey will talk about that in a minute, but the majority of the avionics bay is this um, blue and or the image I showed before right beneath it. So again, this is right below the air brakes, which is why, if you notice at the far right of the payload systems bay, there is a gray disc. So this represents the, it has not yet been designed, but this is where the um, COTS flight computer and the barometer will be placed. So just far away from any of that irregular pressure behavior. And again, as you can see, the avionics is contained within the coupler. Okay, so moving into the electrical hardware, the SRAD flight computer is probably our biggest single project this year. So this is, we are hoping to use this as the primary flight computer. So the Space World America Cup requires us to have two flight computers. One of them may be SRAD, one of them must be COTS. Uh, so we are striving to have at least one of the, or have one of them be SRAD. Uh, this specifically is built around an STM32 microcontroller. So that is just a small processor 
that is specifically suited for these uh, lower requirement processing needs like your own. And it does a lot of different tasks. Specifically, we're looking at the recovery task, so that's the most important thing avionics does. So we are taking a bunch of sensor inputs, we are interpreting them, detecting when we're at Apogee, and then sending that signal to recovery to deploy the parachutes. Uh, we're also handling the air brakes controls on here, so we have an algorithm I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and that will be running on board this device. Again, just general data acquisition, so we have sensors that are critical for recovery and for air brakes, and then we also have some other sensors that are just useful to know about the state of the rocket, so those will also be feeding into here as well. And then, like I mentioned, we're required to be transmitting the GPS tracking uh, back to ground, but we'll also be tracking all these sensor values. Um, so yeah, just to hammer in the main purpose here, so this will calculate the altitude and detect the apogee uh, with barometric pressure and acceleration. So we're using both of those figures combined. Uh, we found that to be more accurate, or more reliable at least. And in terms of arming, we're going to go with a physical arming method. So in the past, BSLI has done a couple remote arming methods. We found those to be more trouble than they're worth, so we arm this physically um, with either a screw switch or remove a for flight tag. That image there is the prototype flight computer from last year, um, and we're building off that for our design this year. The COTS flight computer we're using, so again, we're required to use at least one commercial flight computer, is the Altus Metrum Easy Mini. Uh, we chose it mainly because it's affordable and it's relatively small, so we lost our more expensive flight computer last year and we're working out the budget. This one met our needs, but at a significantly lower price point. As well, also it's uh, very widely used and well documented within the rocketry community. Uh, this device specifically uh, detects Apogee only barometrically, so that's why it was so important for us to move it away from the air brakes to avoid you know, any, any air from that. And similar to the Astro flight computer, this is armed physically with either a screw switch or a removal for flight tag. Um, so all of our S electronics, we have our own custom power management circuit for that. So they have different requirements between both voltage and current. So we've designed a circuit to regulate that safely and cleanly to make sure all of our systems are powered um, within the rocket. This is sort of running in the background. It's not necessarily like a feature in itself, but it just supports the rest of our systems. Uh, and it's also, it includes battery charging over USB-C, so rather than having to uh, carry in one of those extra battery charges, we can just plug it in like you would with your phone or your computer. Uh, so an important thing this year, so all of the voltage regulation circuitry has been simulated in SPICE. Uh, that's a circuit simulation software, so before we even order or, design or build these circuit boards, we should have a pretty good understanding of how they're going to behave, and what we, might, what we might need to look out for. So the s -Red radio, um, <clears throat> so this will be used for GPS tracking and telemetry both. And it's a new device this year, entirely new to BSLI, and we think it's entirely new to Spaceport America Cup in general. Uh, but basically it's built around an S2 LP RF transceiver, so that's a small integrated circuit that handles some of the higher frequency stuff. Uh, but we are operating in the 70 centimeter band, specifically at 433 megahertz, um, to comply with the FCC and the SAC requirements. So this specific circuit board is unique in that it's also a shared part of my capstone project, so it's a joint BSLI capstone uh, with the ECE department. Um, so it's, it's in both worlds, but we hope to fly it on the rocket uh, in June. So in terms of the SRAD radio, the antennas we're using, we are considering both SRAD and COTS options, but regardless of what we look at, we're going to be doing a lot more characterization this year. Um, as in the past, BSLI has done very little in the way of characterizing their antennas and their performance. We have reason to think that SRAD antennas may allow us to achieve higher gain uh, and better signal-to-noise ratio, which would improve the range of our tracking systems, uh, though of course we need to verify that in the laboratory. So we'll be going over to the, uh, the Electro Science Laboratory on West Campus. They have a pretty large anechoic chamber over there where we can put in our antenna uh, in the configured form with the rest of the rocket so we can measure not only antenna's performance but also uh, get a better understanding of how it's going to interact with any other component of the rocket, notably the aluminum motor tube, which is right next to it. Um, and again, this is just part of our goal to increase our understanding in our evidence-based design. So, as our COTS redundant tracking solution, we're going to be using the Altus Metrum Tel GPS. So, 
this is going to be working alongside the SRD radio. And the purpose of this is, again, just redundancy. It's not specifically required, but just given the new nature of the SRD radio, we decided this was a wise idea. Similar to the Easy Mini, this is widely used and very well documented. It has performed well for us in the past, including this past year. Um, and so this is important to us, again, just as we're not entirely sure of the behavior of the new SRD system. To control the air brakes, uh, we're using a NEMA 17 stepper motor. So this is to extend and retract them. The one we're looking at currently, so it runs off of five volts and one amp. So this is ideal for us so we don't have to regulate to like 24 volts or something higher. Uh, it has a 1.8 degree step angle. So that allows us, that basically means that uh, stepper motors, you turn them in discrete increments. And this one, you, the finest you can turn it in is 1.8 degrees. And this is rated for 69.39 ounce inches of holding torque. So this number was based off of the simulations that structures and aerodynamics ran on the torque values needed to, um, to actuate the air brakes in the worst conditions. And currently this is planning to be powered by a dedicated separate battery from our like sort of recovery critical electronics. So moving into the software side, the flight software, and when I say flight software, I'm, I'm referring to the code that is running on the flight computer within the rocket, uh, which is different from a ground control software. So importantly, this is written in C, uh, so it's a fairly low level programming language, um, at least for this specific case. We're using a library or a plugin called FreeRTOS, so this allows us to handle multiple tasks at once, so I mentioned it has a lot of different things it's doing. This allows us to achieve that. And we're developing this within the STM32 Cube IDE software. So I mentioned the STM32 microcontroller is just very easy to work with. Part of that is because of this development software. And our goal here is to find the balance between optimizing this flight computer for the current year solutions, uh, while also leaving the door open for building upon it in the future. For example, if the liquid engine project ever hopes to fly um, on a rocket, we could hopefully share some of this technology with them. So these, the, uh, the main tasks of the flight software. So the first one and the other tasks rely on this is to aggregate sensor data. So notably we have a barometer and accelerometer. Uh, there's a bunch of other sensors as well, but we are collecting all of that and we are keeping track of, you know, when those sensor readings are taken and uh, what is the relation. We then need to interpret that sensor data correctly to time recovery events. So we need to be able to tell definitively if we are at Apogee, if we are not at Apogee, if we're doing the burn, that sort of thing. So this is going to be uh, not just for recovery events, but also for air brakes. I mentioned we have some safeguards against preventing those from deploying early. So the flight software is divided into different uh, flight schemes almost. So based on the sensor data, we can just fully lock out certain functionalities. So if we are measuring an acceleration or velocity that is sustained above a threshold given to us by our dynamics or structures, uh, we can just fully lock out any of that functionality. Uh, tying into that, so we're running the air brakes control algorithm on this processor as well, um, as well as just tracking other connected systems and transmitting not only just raw sensor data, but also data about the decisions we're making in flight back to ground control. And the challenge of this is that we need to be doing all of this at once uh, very quickly and also very accurately. Uh, so we need to be very careful with our software development. So to talk more about the air brakes controls, so uh, I'll just preface this by saying we have not developed the specific control algorithm or the control le loop yet. We have been dedicating or focusing most of our work on understanding the dynamics of the system um, and basically how it behaves absent of any air brakes so then we can determine where to insert them. Specifically we're looking at how well can we predict the rocket's apogee uh, given certain initial conditions of velocity and drag coefficient. So we have these two equations here which represent that. So we have one showing the uh, change in velocity or the acceleration and then one of the angular acceleration. Uh, so we're looking at a couple of different numerical methods to solve these in flight because again we can't pull up MATLAB on the flight computer. We have to solve these in C on a fairly uh, low power microcontroller. So we have two different methods. We've looked at the first order orders method and the fourth order Runga Kuta method. Uh, they have different levels of accuracy but also different computational times and costs. So we're just looking at the balance between those. So like I mentioned, we're looking at our ability to predict right now. And 
even with the same set of sensor readings, our ability to predict with confidence varies a lot based on how we interpret those and how we weight those different sensor readings together. Uh, so I have a couple or two examples right here. So the one on the graph on top, you're looking at this is just based off of barometric data. So the blue dots are the current barometric altitude, and the orange dots is where our algorithm predicts the final aperture will be. So as you can see, there's a lot of noise and uncertainty up until almost when we're at Apogee, at which point we don't really have the ability to control our flight or the Apogee much more. Uh, but once we go down to the bottom graph, in this case, we're using just a simple weighted average of the barometric value and then uh, the integral of the acceleration, so that's velocity. And we can look that we have much higher certainty as to the final apogee much earlier, which is important to us because the earlier we can be relatively certain, uh, that, mean, that just gives us more time to work with the air brakes and control them. So the data for both of these that you see here, this is the 2022 Space for America flight, um, which was over all things considered nominal, so we hope it provides us a pretty good basis into um, validating our system. We're hoping to generate some data based on calculations and other previous data to interpolate and give us a wider range of systems to uh, account for. And I've just got the specific sensor uh, part numbers right there. So uh, before we, again, so before we actually develop a specific you know, implementation for our controls. There's a lot more math, mathematical analysis we need to do to understand what's going on with the system. Uh, and the reason for this is we don't want to design a control system for a, or a control algorithm for a system we don't understand, and then once we try to implement it or test it, we realize it's behaving completely differently than expected. So the first thing after we get some of that worked out from the previous slide is looking at the stability of the system, and ideally we want this to be an asymptotically stable system, uh, which basically means it's going to converge on a specific point. So in this context, that equilibrium point would be the 30,000 foot apogee. I'm using the term equilibrium point kind of incorrectly here. Uh, obviously the real equi equilibrium point is when the rocket is laying on the ground after it's landed, but this refers to if we look at the initial conditions in which the rocket has enough momentum to reach 30,000 feet, uh, does our system converge on that 30,000 foot point? And what's going to go into determining that is what ability to control the system do the air brakes actually give us, right? So we can model coefficient of drag just abstractly and look at how that affects the equation. So we need to uh, quantify and characterize how quickly can we actually deploy those how will that take effect immediately, that sort of thing. So basically look at what is our authority to control the system and how does that play into our stability and our ability to reach 30,000 feet. Another very important metric to us is understanding how any particular adjustment is going to affect our ability to make future adjustments. So we don't want to, you know, way over adjust at the beginning and then lose the ability to actually reach 30,000 feet. So again, uh, there's a lot more mathematical analysis we need to do before we can actually implement a controller. I have a very basic uh, flow chart on the right, just giving the very broad outline of what we're hoping to do. So the first step in this system is, as soon as we start flying, we're going to be calculating essentially what is the drag coefficient needed to reach 30,000 feet. Um, so this is gonna give us our baseline, or the starting point for the rest of our feedback control. So we calculate that value, so if we have a specific air brake deployment amount. Uh, we can deploy them to part of that. We're going to undershoot this specifically to give us more ability to control in the future. Uh, and then we can start calculating like a new predicted apogee, determine if an adjustment needs to be made, and then cycle back through. Uh, so again, at the CDR, we're going to have a much better description of what's actually going on under the hood. We're still very much in the research phase for the air brakes control. So transitioning over to the ground control software. So uh, we have an SRI ground control software this year. Uh, it's a continuation of a project from last year. And this interfaces between the rocket and the flight computer on the rocket, and then also any computer on the ground. So basically, mainly we're, we are receiving information from the rocket, that GPS tracking, as well as whatever other values we choose to transmit. And the motivation for this was, in previous years, we've used 
COT solutions like Ball Aerospace, they have a software called Cosmos. And while it nominally met our needs, it was definitely overpowered and just a lot more to deal with than we really needed and lacked uh, easy customizability for our specific goals. A uh, new feature we're pretty excited about this year is we have a digitized version of the avionics integration checklist within this software. And a lot of the items on that checklist can actually be checked automatically. So we can look at a voltage or we can look at a current or we can measure continuity. Uh, the circuit can be doing this itself and then we can transmit that back. So once we've closed the rocket up, uh, we should be able to tell, okay, has anything changed? Something come disconnected that we may not be able to see externally. And this software is uh, developed primarily in Python with the DeerPy GUI library. Uh, so I've got a screenshot right here. Um, so this is our main data viewing window. So we can have different plots of essentially any value that we can measure, we can plot here. So for example, we have altitude on the top left and acceleration. And then also typically we'll be listing out specific uh, numerical values at the present time on the left and right. The goal of this is to be totally customizable, so we can change this on the fly, you know, on competition day if we wanted to. We can also have different configurations for different stages of flights, so uh, usually the information you're looking at during launch may be different than during recovery. Um, and then also we have the checklist I mentioned where many of these items can be checked by the flight computer automatically and then their status can be transmitted back to us just to make sure we're extra certain about the reliability of our SRAD solutions. Um, so tying into the SRAD and the SRAD solutions is the hardware in the loop testing we're hoping to do this year. So similar to some of the air brakes controls, this is still something we're starting up and we haven't gotten too far into yet, but I'll just go over the general concept. Um, so to test and validate these new SRAD solutions, we need some more rigorous ways to test than we've done in the past. So we need to actually understand if our tests are meaningfully representing what they will experience during flight. And so we're really focusing on how can we replicate flight conditions as closely as possible in our testing. Uh, because a test that doesn't really replicate flight conditions is not terribly useful uh, to us. The main way we're going to do this is for example, any device that is using sensor input, so the flight computer is the obvious example, to make decisions about recovery, for example. We can simulate those inputs and we can feed those into the device as if they were coming in live from the physical environment. And then on device, the software is running on the actual flight computer. It can make decisions based on those and then we can test the output of that to verify that. We'll start off based on previous flight data. Hopefully we'll find, we're looking into ways of possibly uh, creating artificial data that we can be confident in for this testing purpose, uh, but that's still ongoing. And again, the goal of this is just to provide higher confidence for the systems, especially given how much SRAT hardware we have. So I have an example here of a case in which we may implement this testing scheme. So on the top you see uh, an example of what's going on on part of the flight computer. So we have the physical world, there is some air pressure which is being read by a sensor. And within that sensor, we're digitizing that value. So we are losing some information and we're looking at ways to see what is being lost. And then it's being sent to the flight software um, on the flight computer to determine recovery events. So if we want to test this as well as possible, uh, short of just an actual test launch, we would simulate data so we could come up with a curve for based on basically look at what is our ascent speed, how will the air pressure decrease with our ascent, uh, run it through a filter that replicates that same digitization process that's occurring on the actual sensor, and then feed that in to the flight computer. So from this, with this method, the flight computer is none the wiser that it's not receiving physical data. So as long as we are really careful about making sure our simulated data is either based on real past data or is um, physically sound, uh, this should allow us to do a lot better and more reliable testing than we have done in the past. Uh, this is just one example. There will obviously be, a, obviously be a lot more which will be outlined in our technical report. Okay, so the risks to project success. So the, uh, two, the two biggest risks are that the SRAD flight computer does not deploy the parachutes at all. So the number one mitigation for this is redundancy. That's why we have the cost flight computer, but also through rigorous testing. So 
a big philosophy on avionics is we want to a lot, we want to mitigate as risk as much as possible through high quality design. So testing is a key component of that. Uh, similarly, if the asteroid flight computer deploys the parachutes early, this may actually be worse because then that could result in a structural failure failure of the rocket. Um, so again, we have that software functionality locking where if the velocity value is above a certain threshold, in which case a premature ejection would damage the rocket, uh, just the ability to deploy the parachutes is locked out internally, almost like an internal arming system. Uh, the air brakes deploying early is another one that could risk a structural failure if it happened too early in the burner with in unideal flight conditions. So again, we're looking at uh, that locking functionality as well as extensive testing and being just extremely confident and rigorous in our mathematical models to understand any case where that might occur. Another problem is if we lose GPS tracking, so if we lose connection, uh, immediately we may not be able to launch, so obviously that holds us, holds us up at the competition, but if it occurs after launch we may have difficulty finding the rocket. Again, the main mitigation here is redundancy within extensive testing as well, so looking at the antenna behavior, seeing the range we can expect, and designing like a pretty high margin of error for that. So on the risk matrix, so the asteroid flight computer deploying the parachutes, not at all. So that is, we rated that as a fairly unlikely event, though pretty major significance that happens. In theory, the cost flight computer is redundant, so it should mitigate that risk, but that one is also not immune to failure. Uh, the asteroid flight computer deploying the parachutes early is very possibly more, or a higher risk, sorry, it is less likely but it is um, more severe. So again, mitigation is just the software locking and extensive testing. Airbrick's deploying early. This is also, we think it's, we have reason to think it's pretty rare, but it may be very severe if it were to happen. And then GPS tracking lost. So this is less severe. It won't, should not result in any sort of structural failure or loss of the device completely. Um, but again, mitigation is redundancy and then the testing and characterization of our systems. Uh, so the plan for the year. So education and training has been a huge focus so far and it will continue to be throughout the rest of the year, though it will taper off a little bit. Uh, same with research, so especially with the air brakes and a lot of the SRAD algorithms, we've just been trying to understand what's going on specifically within these systems, especially as we have a team of mostly CSE and ECE people, so it's getting up to speed on a lot of the aerodynamics of it as well. Uh, currently, and then into November, we're working on subsystem design, so I mentioned the mechanical team, they'll be machining the avionics bay, or at least a lot of it, uh, this coming week and next week. We have a lot of different subsystems, so they're all sort of working in parallel, but then we'll be transitioning to assembly uh, near the end of the semester and a little bit of early next semester. After that point, we are ideally done making any significant changes to the system, so we're into the you know, laboratory testing, making any tweaks as we see fit, and then field testing, and then finally we'll validate our systems formally and write up documentation on them for future years. Are there any questions? Uh, we've got one question on chat. Uh, Casey Ruckman says, I like the testing to show antenna transmission behavior. In 2022, I recall issues with location data during the descent. Are there any mitigations for ensuring enough GPS satellites to stay locked during flight? Mm -hmm. So, GPS satellites, we sort of have control over that. Obviously, we don't have control over how many GPS satellites are above us. Uh, we are looking to use an active GPS. So, I, if I remember correctly from 2022, the GPS antenna was passive. This year, we have a amplifier. Uh, attached to that, so we should have a stronger signal strength. So if there aren't any GPS satellites in view, unfortunately, we may drop out for a few seconds, but if there are some in view, we will have a higher chance of connecting to them. Um, and yeah, we also, we should also be able to get a lot of those metrics, at least extrapolate them from our position measurements, though those will probably drift from the reality somewhat. So you show the stepper motor? Yes. Is that one motor to control all four? Yes. Uh, four motors? Yes. Yeah, so there is one motor, and Corey or Cam could tell you the details about this. But yes, one motor, they're all. So, yeah, all of them are deployed the same amount. They're all on the same linkage. So there's no um, possibility that you could deploy two or asymmetrically, you're either going to get four or zero? 
So yeah, we could, uh, yes. So yeah, the design, unless there's like a failure in the design, they will all, either, they will all be deployed in unison. Lines of code. I <laughs> I don't know if I, I mean, we're still writing the code. Probably all in all, a couple thousand. Oh, it was for which part? Like the entire system overall, or the air brakes? Yeah, software scares the heck out of me. <laughs> Historically, it's just it's always more complicated than you think it's going to be. It costs five times as much as you think. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, how many lines of code? Yeah, I would ballpark it at. Maybe 1,000 lines of code on the flight computer. Okay. Um, you also said something that kind of scared me, like, well, we could change, we could make changes to software even the day of the launch. So that was only the ground control software. That. Okay. Then so you have a configuration management. That leads to my question. You have a configuration management strategy around the software. So does Lauren just get to decide? You know, I'm going to make some changes mm -hmm. today, and uh, it would be great. Yeah, so I should clarify, when I say changes, so that's not changes to the code that's running, that's sort of changes to just which windows are we displaying at once. So anything that's critical to the rocket's behavior will be locked in by March or April, and then we will not touch that. Uh, once it's fully validated, we'll lock it in, that will not be touched at all. Mm -hmm. is, how you're going through and making sure that you're testing as close as you can to fly hardware is, is good. Um, but many, many times you'll find the software gets to a place in flight that just never got to on the ground. Mm -hmm. want to make sure that that happens, so. Yeah, that's definitely something we're looking out for. Unfortunately, we have about probably at least 15 people working on the software this year. So, yeah, we are... We have we do have mitigation plans in order to help with this. All right, yeah, some kind of configuration management system, mm -hmm. something around the code. Yeah, and so all the code we, I mean, we are tracking with like version control and Git. So uh, we have some pretty clear rules about if you make modifications, you have to test them first before you can merge them in with the rest of the code. Um, I could follow a couple things there. You talked about the stepper motor. They showed a quick picture of it. Nobody's connected the dots between the two yet, how this thing actually functions to deploy air brakes. Mm -hmm. So who's in charge when we get, you're doing the software obviously, but I, I, I'm missing the connection. We, we yeah. talked about it, so who's in charge of that and could, Mm -hmm. So and the next one, I would ex somebody please explain that more because that seems critical to what you're sure. doing this year. So yeah, air brakes is sort of a joint effort between structures, avionics, and aerodynamics. So on the physical side, structures has built, or they are building the essentially all of the mechanical structures. So the blades themselves, the housing, and then the fitting for the motor. Uh, what avionics is handling is we have or we've selected a motor based on values given to us of the torque requirements. And so that will just screw into there. And then from the motor to the software to the sensors is entirely within avionics. Of course, we're working with aerodynamics to get certain values and understand what's going on better. But yeah, that's the, the physical divide. So this torque, what's going to generate the torque the motor is overcoming and being able to hold? Mm -hmm. So Sawyer may be able to answer this question better than I could, or um, one of the Really, the, uh, the torque I think that was shown on the slides was just a, really a pretty large overestimation of um, wind force that could enact on the, if all four blades were deployed. So, do we have the rocket, which wind are we talking about? The, I'm flying from uh, the air uh, wind, we talked about perpendicular wind. wind. So, what speed is this rocket spinning while this is? We're talking about this number. Do we have to worry? We have a mass. We're sticking it out. There are clearly torques involved by moving masses in and out of a spinning object. Are those numbers just irrelevant? I mean, they're small enough that we just ignore it, or uh, I don't think. Yeah, I don't believe that's been simulated yet. Yeah. Or calculated. Because so right, isn't that a problem some rockets have as they start spinning really fast and then they've got 
like a masses. That's actually something we should definitely look into. Our, I guess, calculations that we've done so far were based on the drag force that will be on those blades and then the perpendicular wind. And we found the perpendicular wind to be much more significant. So I'd have to assume the spin rock would also be pretty significant there as well. Um, so we'll look more into that and see if that work value changes. And then on the software side, you've talked about the functionality locking. Mm -hmm. But that software base, so what if it fails or it's getting a faulty signal into the thing that tells it mm -hmm. lock out when it shouldn't be or unlock when it shouldn't be unlocking? What's the fail safe behind that? So, like at some point, um, so we, the only, the problem is when we're in flight, the only thing we have to go off of is our sensor data. Um, so we are, the, the fail safe to this is, this may not be anything we're looking for, but we're tr the strategy we're taking is trying to understand the so the sensor's behavior. So, not just seeing them as a black box, but how do they actually convert uh, you know physical values into digital readings? So, trying to understand that, um, understanding the conditions around those rockets that the sen sensors will be exposed to. So, uh, and I sort of mentioned a little bit we move those higher up to avoid any irregular pressure behavior. Uh, but then also looking at our control system and seeing how does it behave to different inputs and a wide range of inputs. And specifically, if we have certain inputs that you know are off nominal, uh, you know, so they're outside of the scope that we're targeting, we still want to be sure that they aren't going to affect our behavior. So we're looking at uh, designing our control algorithms and our control structures to uh, essentially only function in these nominal conditions and not function otherwise. Um, though ultimately, if the sensors are just, you know, by an act of God, just completely off, we may just unfortunately uh, lose the ability yeah. to control I mean, that. As you write the code, right, that's the key is to mm -hmm. so All other cases, don't deploy them because it could be a structural yeah. failure on launch if it mm -hmm. errors that way. And part of this also going in, so we, have, we do have multiple sensors, uh, both, you know, redundant versions of the same sensor, but also different types of sensors. So a barometer and an accelerometer can both give us roughly the same reading. Obviously, there's going to be different errors associated with each ones, but we can look at the two of those, and if one of them is diverging like super quickly from the other, we can have some sort of stop get in there. Okay. That's maybe the one other point we've talked about, you know, barometric pressure sensor, mm -hmm. we've talked about that's got to be near the nose because of traffic. But barometric pressure can't be impacted by things sticking out, right? Barometric pressure, that's just the pressure that exists. So um, we're not really talking barometric pressure. Oh, so yeah, I may have used the incorrect term I'm, there. I'm here, that's the term. Okay, right, so. so I, I'm just pointing out that term. Okay, yeah, so the air pressure the sensor is exposed you know, to. The local static pressure clearly is impacted by it, but mm -hmm. yeah. I'm yeah. pointing it out because they're letting the ECE person talk about it, and one of the arrows should notice that term being used in a way they don't. They know it shouldn't be used. So all right. That's on all the rest of the <laughs> pointed right. out, not you. So the, the drag system, if you're going up the hill and it fails, does it fail stowed or in the last stepper motor deployed so position? Or will it fail? How will it fail? Can when you say it fails, can you define what do you mean but like like a physical failure of the system or the software fails to, like a sensor failure? So I'm not worried necessarily about, you know, one of the things comes off. Mm -hmm. right? You get a sensor failure, you get, a, you, get a, you get some kind of confusion in the software, I don't know. Does it fail, either if it's not deployed yet, it fails stowed. Yes. It just won't open. Correct. If it's partially deployed, let's say you click the stepper mode two steps, mm -hmm. does it fail in, that configuration with no further ability to adjust, or does, is there a mode where if you have a failure, you just you just pull it back in and fly? Mm -hmm. So we need to look in this a little bit more. The current plan was to just if we if we cannot trust our sensors, if we're not confident in that, we'll just retract them. Uh, propulsion has characterized the motor to not exceed the FAA limit, anyways. Okay. So in that case, we would just retract them to avoid risking. That's just a really good point. You have a choice here to decide how you want to fail, mm -hmm. right? Depending on what goes on, right? 
you just give up and say, okay, well, I've clicked the motor two steps and I'm out and I'm just gonna take what I get. Or you could say, look, something's not right. I'm gonna pull them in and we'll just fly. Yeah. And I so thinking through that is important. I'm not, I didn't expect you to have a decision yet at PBR, but mm -hmm. you can choose how to fail. And that might actually, choosing how to fail sometimes gives you pathways to do better. Yeah. Mm, so we'll, we'll definitely look into that and yes. Personally, that's all the time we have for questions right now. Okay, and I'll now hand it over to Calvin to discuss recovery. Thank you, Peter, for that marvelous introduction. Uh, so, hello, all. I'm the uh, recovery lead this year. My name is Calvin Beal. Uh, this is my first time as a lead in recovery and like a couple of other, other uh, leadership members, so this is going to be fun. All right, so what is the purpose of recovery? Obviously, we want to bring the rocket back safely, um, so obviously that entails releasing the nose cone, the drogue parachute, and the main parachute. Um, the nose cone and the drogue parachute are released at the same time because that's our main apogee uh, recovery event. And then when we release our main parachute, that's a separate recovery event that occurs at about 1,500 feet. We'll get into that later. Um, and obviously we want to, well, not obviously, we want to design and build a single separation dual deployment recovery system. So um, basically the whole recovery system is ejected from the rocket when the nose cone is ejected. So we only have one body tube separation point. Um, we'll get into why that's optimal a little on the next slide. Um, so basically for this year, uh, the design is to, or the idea is to utilize a uh, parachute bag for protecting the parachute and retaining it, a uh, pyrotechnic pin puller system to uh, essentially deploy the parachute from that bag, and uh, we also have to have shock cords and loops and things like that that all recovery systems usually have. Um, and obviously we want to test the whole system systematically and very meticulously because it has a high frequency of failure. <laughs> And of course, later on in the year, when we have uh, less workload, because we'll already have had our test launch, we want to research future plans for you know, different ideas that we could go about recovery. So if uh, you know anything about BSLI Spaceport, we've done single, uh, single point separation in the past for our recovery, and it has not gone well. I don't think in the past, how many years, two years, we haven't had a su single perfect flight either the main parachute is deployed at Apogee. We have no main parachute deployment whatsoever, or, well, this isn't really a recovery thing, but the, uh, you know, drogue parachute might not come out because the nose cone isn't deployed, but it's an avionics problem. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, why are we continuing this? It seems so unreliable. Uh, so, two points of separation usually increases, well, it will increase the number of points of failure uh, because of the increased number of couplers. So it's basically more load on structures. Um, also, there's slightly less body tube length uh, with a uh, single point of separation, because if you have two points of separation, you need a little bit of extra uh, body tube to accompany or account for those extra parts that you need, like ejection canisters and such, whatnot. Um, and also, yeah, that would reduce the chance of buckling. So if you have a really long body tube, I don't know if you guys have seen the old uh, 60s rockets where they would just crump crumble. It's not ideal. Um, and so going off that, we want to uh, redistribute the workload from other sub-teams. Obviously, we're doing the new air brake system, um, uh, and avionics has also got a lot on their plate. And uh, so if, uh, yeah, avionics and structures are working a lot on air brakes. They have a lot more work to do on that, and it's usually a lot of work to uh, go with a two-point separation for structures anyways. Um, also, a relocation of avionics would be necessary in a dual point separation because you need a, uh, that transition piece to have your uh, avionics within it because you have to have those two ejection charge or charges armed by avionics and it's not ideal. Um, also this year we have returning members in recovery. Uh, I don't know what the re retention rate is for recovery in the past, but uh, it's myself, I was in recovery last year and I've got two more returning members who are very experienced and very good at recovery skills. Um, and so also, I want to uh, properly test and execute this system this year to prove its reliability. Uh, I want to improve the testing and documentation compared to previous years. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of that in previous years. Um, and I want to uh, identify and correct to the weak points. So typically there's been some decisions where it's a, quite an obvious weak point, but it was never corrected. 
the reasons of which are a little bit iffy. So we have several Ezra requirements. We're a highly critical system. Obviously, recovery must uh, work perfectly. Not perfectly, but at least enough to not kill people. Um, so since the BSLA Spaceport America Cup rocket will be achieving an apogee above 1,500 feet, it must utilize dual deployment recovery. So basically, we need, we need to deploy a, some sort of recovery event at apogee, and we need to have some sort of recovery event uh, at approximately 1,500 feet. This is essentially so that it, the rocket doesn't drift for miles because we're flying very high. Um, since this year, the uh, parachute release mechanism is intended to be SRAD. Uh, it must be redundant, ground tested, and uh, controlled from separate flight computers. So I need to allow Peter to uh, have redundant control on every recovery event that occurs. So essentially the uh, nose cone deployment and main parachute deployment. Um, also, our descent rate under drogue must be between 65 and 165 feet per second. It's a very large window, mostly because our densities of air can change. Uh, parachute performance is very sporadic. It's it nearly impossible to predict. Ask any NASA engineer. Um, and the, uh, yeah, main parachute deployment, uh, like, sequence must not initiate above 1,500 feet. So basically, we can't do anything to deploy the parachute above 1,500 feet. That'd be a violation of the rules. So uh, all, also, uh, the recovery components must be protected from the flame of the recovery energetics. So we use uh, pyrotechnic ejection charges and uh, pyrotechnic pin pullers. We need to make sure that's not going to cook, cook up our shock cords and parachutes and such. So uh, my sort of personal system requirements, uh, we must separate the nose cone and deploy the drogue at Apogee. Um, this is somewhat arbitrary. It's just. Ideally, that's the lowest velocity that the rocket is going to have. So, I mean, this is more of a, again, an avionics sort of problem, but I just want to make sure that when Peter's signal does actually initiate, you know, the nose cone does deploy, the drogue does deploy. Um, we also must deploy the main parachute between 1,500 and 500 feet. This is because there is some time it takes for the main parachute to deploy from the initial sequence of the main parachute deployment. Uh, so we can fire a pyrotechnic, but there's a certain amount of time between that fire and the main parachute being fully unfurled. So we need to account for that. Um, we must allow for the avionics to maintain redundancy. That was kind of stated in the Ezra requirements, but it's also one of my personal requirements. Uh, uh, I, I want to maintain a descent speed of approximately 80 feet per second uh, between 30,000 and 1,500 feet. This is just a nice, comfortable area between that window that is provided by Ezra. It's not too fast, not too slow should give us a decent uh, amount of drift versus time for recovery. There's a little MATLAB script that does a very, very basic uh, calculation of that. Um, and I don't want the rocket to impact the ground uh, any fast. well, should allow the rocket to impact the ground at approximately 15 p feet per second. So again, it's, it's sort of an arbitrary value. Uh, we're going to be using uh, commercial off-the-shelf parachutes this year. So we can't really fine tune our precise descent rate, especially because of also, uh, again, it's hard to predict the exact uh, speed you're gonna hit the ground. So we also don't have our exact rocket mass yet. So um, I also want the system to be uh, volumetrically efficient and uh, we should help to reduce wind drift from the launch site because it's a very long hike into the desert retrieving the thing. So the general design process for this uh, subsystem, uh, we want to research methods of single point, uh, or, yeah, single separation dual deployment. So again, there's a lot of ways to go about uh, uh, this sort of uh, system. So you know that's like combing through forums and yada yada. Um, then brainstorming ideas with the whole sub team on different methods to do this. So basically having whiteboard sessions where we all sit around and uh, look at different ways to do about it go about it, um, talk about the potential flaws of different ideas and whatnot. Um, then we want to proto we prototype our chosen ideas, so we basically make little mock-ups from basic materials. Uh, we want to see basically if the thing will function in the most basic sense mechanically and whatnot. So, make, you know, if we design a bag, we want it to actually be able to come out of that bag and like how are we going to open that bag. Um, and then full-scale prototyping and testing, so that's where we construct a full-scale prototype of the system. You know, we perform simulations on applicable parts, and we test the uh, system and further iterate on that design. This is a sort of basic uh, chart of my ideal fabrication process. Uh, nothing really specific, uh, basically just designing, fabricating, fixing that design, and then testing it again, ensure it works, 
before the test launch. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be utilizing a parachute bag this year. Um, so for the design process, we uh, researched uh, different uh, designs uh, to maintain the parachute while the rocket is descending from 30,000 feet to 1,500 feet. Um, so we brainstormed different ways to uh, design this, again, whiteboard days. Uh, so we constructed the mock-up. It's that little red thing in the corner there. That was our first mock-up. It's made from an old t-shirt and some grommets that we hammered in. Um, and then we uh, constructed our full-scale prototype, which is the yellow bag that's made out of Kevlar. Um, and so next up, we want to test these prototypes with uh, drop tests, car tests, get into that a little bit later, load tests and pull tests. Um, and basically, yeah, just drop it from things, throw it out of cars, beat it up, um, <laughs> test, you know, how it performs under loads. And then we want to construct our final product. So uh, the prototype isn't super presentable. You know, <laughs> there's a little bit of fraying. There's a little bit of, you know, things that aren't super nice looking about it, but it's a prototype. So again, like I said, the uh, release mechanism is going to be SRAD this year. So it's the prototype pyrotechnic pin puller release mechanism and the pyrotechnic pin puller release mechanism. Most of the images on the screen are of the prototype pyrotechnic pin puller release mechanism. <laughs> so um, basically the prototype is one pin. So we're simulating the forces that are going to be occurring in that localized sort of area. Um, again, we want it to be redundant. So it's going to have two pins that are going to need to be pulled. Um, so we want to first research different methods of pin pulling. So believe it or not, there's a lot of ways to have an explosion make a pin go that way. Um, so then we want to construct uh, our 3D print prototypes. So there's a little 3D printed prototype basically there to uh, test an earlier design, which was fully mechanical rather than utilizing uh, lines. And then uh, performing hand calculations uh, basically on the loads. So. Uh, in the next slide, I have a couple of pictures of just some example hand calculations and free body diagrams. Um, we want to design it and simulate it in CAD. So this is a uh, stress simulation here of the uh, basically a distributed load across that pin, pulling it upwards. So seeing where the stresses lie there. Um, so then we uh, machine the PPPR, P -P 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 -R -M <laughs> and test it. So basically testing it under the expected loads, plus some, minus some. So basically, whatever loads it might be enduring when it tries to fire and uh, release the main parachute, so you, it would basically, it's just going to be suspended from a board and the line is going to be released ideally. And then we'll obviously redesign it as necessary. We're not certain this is an ideal design. This is a very early stage. Uh, again, I've looked into a lot of different ways of pin pulling pyrotechnically. Um, this is just the simplest mechanically and the simplest to test. And also, this helps with uh, testing for like friction coefficients because there's uh, not much data on friction coefficients between things like uh, low carbon steel and uh, Kevlar. So again, here's some examples of hand calculations. The free body diagrams can get really pretty sketchy really fast. So that's why we went with the uh, line system rather than the mechanical system. Uh, it was pretty difficult to calculate the exact loads that were going to be on it without going into actual simulations. Um, and without specific geometry, it's kind of hard to do exact simulations. So it was a lot easier to get a free body diagram of three lines. Uh, we use a specific system of uh, ropes. To basically release that one rope uh, that uh, can go around two pins and an anchor point. Um, so yeah. So the broad overview of the system, uh, the descent rates need to be main pa maintained by parachute diameter. So basically, we do some basic calculations about uh, the rocket's mass and the parachute's diameter. Uh, most parachute fabricators have uh, drag coefficients listed on their website. It's kind of hard to depend on that because, again, your descent rates can vary drastically depending on your current flight conditions. So you know, there's no standard atmospheric density that you can entirely rely upon. You can just assume, you know, New Mexico is probably going to have these conditions. You're probably going to have these conditions at the launch site. And again, we're going to have vastly different conditions from our test launches to New Mexico at launch or the spaceport launch because uh, it's going to be early spring during our test launches. So it's going to be extremely cold. Our densities are going to be different. The humidities are going to be different. So again, very approximate descent rates, just enough to be within healthily and safely within the uh, requirements for Ezra and also for our main parachute so that it doesn't hit the ground too hard. So 
Uh, we're going to have aluminum ejection canisters to pressurize the recovery bay for the recov main recovery event, which is the nose cone deployment. This is the most critical event if we don't deploy the nose cone. We're hitting the ground really hard. <laughs> Um, so this deploys the drogue, uh, overcomes shear pins holding the nose cone in, so we need to perform some calculations, basically the pressure that we need to generate and how much black powder to use. Uh, we haven't gone into the specifics of those calculations yet, mostly because we don't know the exact volume of our nose cone quite yet, so those calculations will happen when we get there. Um, the parachute must be retained within a parachute bag, so from, again from launch to, to uh, 30,000 feet and then down to 1,500 feet, this parachute needs to stay in this bag, it's very critical. Um, and all the lines associated with that parachute need to stay in that bag. And then for the main parachute release, again, we have a pyrotechnic pin puller that releases the lines that hold the bag shut. Uh, we have redundant uh, it, pyrotechnics for uh, avionics and for their criticality. Um, and the line lengths and line retention uh, techniques, uh, are through testing, we're going to optimize so that uh, we have a smooth main parachute deployment. So that main parachute system overview, uh, basically the parachute is going to be retained in a conical Kevlar bag. Again, that it allows for a be better fit and uh, easier unfurling. So we did a basic pull test where somebody held the bag and somebody held the uh, retention line or the lines of the parachute and basically pull it out. Uh, worked a lot better than in previous years because conical shape kind of just convinces it to come out a little better. Um, also, the tensile strength of Kevlar is extremely high, arbitrarily high in this case, uh, and it's also highly flame resistant. So that's why we chose it, because we've got a lot of energetics. Uh, the bag is kept closed with a release line. I usually get a lot of questions about this. How do we hold the bag closed? Uh, usually we use some form of grommets uh, that basically over, so the bottom of the bag folds over on itself and we use some grommets to hold it shut. And we mostly rely on the tension from the recovery events to hold it shut, although there is a moment of lapse in tension when the nose cone is deployed. Uh, but usually we just pack the parachute properly and we retain the lines properly with some breakable restraints, like something as basic as tape. So um, yeah, uh, the release line and the, uh, er, sorry, yeah, the release line is released with the pyrotechnic pin puller. Again, that's a new SRED system to replace the tender descenders that we've used in previous years. Um, uh, these have to be, this has to be redundant because of uh, being redundant, in saying that I'm redundant, um, basically for avionics and because of criticality. Um, and when we used our tender descenders last year for the current design, um, there would be a pin that would be left behind and that wasn't ideal. Usually you don't want parts falling off your rocket that you don't want falling off your rocket. So yeah, this is uh, mostly a way to prevent that sort of problem. Um, and then again, there's several uh, different iterations to be tested and uh, we use E matches. So basically an electrically fired match, you send a voltage, it has high resistance and some flammable chemical on top of that to ignite. So our parachutes and shock cords and our bulkhead overview, uh, basically the we want the shock cords to sustain the expected loads plus a very high factor of safety because they're highly critical. Uh, we want them to be of an opti optimal length. Uh, we don't really have specific values for these shock cord lengths. Um, we pretty much plan to start with arbitrary initial values and then modify it through testing. So if we find a line is too short, we'll lengthen it. If we find a line is too long, we'll shorten it. Um, we have a U-bolt, uh, ejection canisters. Uh, we have to worry about the alignment of the load and uh, Oh yeah, load, load bearing components on the bulkhead. Um, so we don't want something that's load bearing to be misaligned with our threaded rods that are gonna be connecting the bulkhead down because that could cause cocking that would be bad and would uh, break our uh, sealing gasket uh, between that bulkhead and the uh, avionics bay, so, or integrated systems bay. Um, so we send our designs over to structures where they test it in FEH and we get feedback on how we could change it. Um, so the uh, we want the parachutes to be of the correct diameter as well. Again, we want our descent rates to be controlled. We want it to be able to actually fit in the rocket. You know, I can't have a 30-foot parachute in the rocket. It just wouldn't fit. And uh, we want the parachutes to unfurl with confidence. So that basically involves properly packing them and uh, assu uh, assuring that the drogue is connected at the optimal point in the uh, shock cord, because there are points you can connect the drogue where it isn't guaranteed to deploy, and if you don't have a drogue deployment, you don't have any recovery at all. So that's a problem. There's a lot of risks to project success. Uh, 
first of all, the drogue not deploying or it just not deploying at the correct time. Um, this is obviously a highly critical problem. Uh, mitigating this uh, is fairly simple. Oh, don't curse myself. Uh, but properly packing it, uh, ensuring the nose cone completely separates at apogee, et cetera. Uh, this is tested with ejection tests, drop tests, and of course the test launch. Uh, there's also the problem that the main parachute may not deploy at the correct time. Uh, we want to mitigate this by essentially properly packing our parachutes, add swivels where necessary. So reducing swivels, or reducing twisting on that bag is ideal. So we want to add swivels above the bag and on parts that are gonna be twisting a lot like the drogue. Um, and again, testing that, we want to do pyrotechnic tests. Those are actually required by Ezra. So you have to test and ensure that our pyrotechnics will actually fire under the expected loads and not fail in any way. We have to do load tests. So we want to test that, again, make sure nothing fails under the expected loads. Um, car tests, uh, that's a fun one. So <laughs> we're going to ideally find a racetrack or somewhere where we can do this without getting in trouble. We want to catapult a section that simulates the uh, rocket in a sort of ballast uh, at the expected drogue descent speed so that we can uh, approximate or approximately simulate the drogue from or the force from the drogue in the wind conditions that the system will be experiencing uh, after assuming that the uh, pin puller event has occurred successfully see if the main parachute will truly unfurl from the bag because that seems to have been our biggest issue in the past um, and then the uh, drop tests there's several types of drop tests we want to employ. Uh, the most basic would be suspending a load that would uh, simulate the expected load from wherever the drogue would be. So essentially, assuming we have a 45 pound force from the drogue, we suspend a 45 pound weight from where the drogue would be attached and basically do a drop test where we drop that mass and uh, simulate the force and see if everything unfurls properly. And then there's the more interesting drop test, which is uh, asking the skydiver, instru skydiving instructor <laughs> to uh, jump out of a plane with a simulated section of body tube, uh, act as the main ejection charge by manually ejecting the nose cone uh, for safety, basically so that you don't have uh, a lot of energetics on, the, on board of the air aircraft. And then uh, he throws away from himself and skydives away. Um, he said he's okay with it. We haven't gotten those tests yet, yet though, so we'll see. And then, of course, the test launch. Uh, we want everything working for the test launch. We don't want to break everybody's stuff and have, make them start over. Um, there's also the big problem of tangles, snaps, snags, and cuts. So a big problem in the past has also been tangling, uh, whether it cuts electrical lines, whether it uh, snags the parachute within the bag, et cetera. Uh, basically, mitigating this, properly packing the system, maintaining proper safety margins. We don't want our lines to snap under loads. Uh, retaining loose lines and canopies with uh, removable restraints. So again, just using some masking tape to retain the lines so that they're not flopping around in the breeze. Um, and then uh, also wrap lines with protective sheaths where they will interact with components of the rocket. So a lot of the corners on the body tube can be pretty sharp. That Kevlar, or sorry, the Carbon fiber, carbon fiber can cut through the Kevlar if it's rubbing up against it wrong. So we want to basically put a Kevlar protective sheath over our shock cords so that their uh, strength isn't compromised. Um, so the risk matrix, uh, we got a lot of risks, a lot of big risks, a lot of very scary risks. Uh, so there's the thought of no drogue parachute deploying. Uh, that's obviously probably the biggest possible problem. Again, the rocket hits the ground at incredibly high speeds if the uh, drogue does not deploy. So again, we want to test that with ejection tests and we want to properly pack the parachute to mitigate that. Um, there's the idea that the main parachute might not deploy. That's a uh, pretty substantial issue. It would just imply that the rocket would hit the ground fairly hard rather than incredibly hard. Uh, in the past, it's resulted in cracked body tube components, but not an ultimate loss of uh, like avionics components, but it's not something we want to risk. Um, so again, we want to test that the most ex most ex that's the thing we want to test most extensively because it's been the biggest trouble in the past. So again, with those car tests, the PPPRM tests, drop tests, and uh, proper packing techniques and utilizing swivels. And there's also the possibility of late or premature main parachute deployment. Um, this is a fairly significant problem because if we deploy the main parachute too early, that could be near apogee, 
and that would mean that our rocket is drifting for miles and miles and we may never retrieve it. Um, and if we deploy it too late, that would mean that the rocket has not decelerated enough from the main parachute to impact the ground at a safe velocity, and again, we could damage bo main uh, body components. Um, there's also the possibility of a uh, parachute release line snapping. Uh, or sorry, I should start with shock cords. There's a chance of a shock cord snapping. This is extremely bad because you know if you get a shock cord snapping, again your rocket hits the ground very fast. Um, we basically want to test this with tensile testing. Uh, we want to shield our uh, shock cords. We want to properly pack things, um, and we want healthy margins of safety. So pretty high. Um, and then there's the possibility of a parachute release cord snapping. Uh, we want we have uh, same the similar uh, mitigations with uh, as the main shock cords but it has a similar risk to like a late or premature main deployment or premature main deployment because essentially if the release line snaps that would simulate it ejecting and we would have a main parachute deployment. And then there's the chance of parts being burned or damaged. Um, this isn't super significant because par plenty of rockets have come down under burnt parachutes. They just get a little crispy. Uh, I mean, it could compromise line strength, so we definitely want to prevent it, but uh, we basically prevent this with uh, Kevlar parachute bags, uh, Kevlar shock cords, make sure our ejection tests are good, uh, test our pyrotechnics, and uh, I also just started looking into baffled ejection charge canisters, which uh, basically mask the flame a little bit, so there's less fire going into the actual recovery bay. So our plan for this year, uh, we do our first, we've already done most of our uh, system design and simulations. Uh, we still need to do some more simulations for the pyrotechnic pin puller. So thus far I've only done simulations for the prototype pyrotechnic pin puller. So basically just load tests and stuff like that. Um, and then there's prototyping that. So we've already started that as well. And the bag, you've seen the prototypes of the bag. And so we've got to go uh, start testing those. Uh, I want to start uh, a lot of the tests ASAP, so um, I'm pretty much ready to start testing that pyrotechnic pin puller. I want to get these t car tests underway. I'm mostly waiting for parts. Um, and we're going to be testing all year. So even after the test launch, I want to be testing things, iterating things, improving things, see where things could fail, even if they haven't in the past. Um, and then there's the test launches. Those are going to be occurring in the uh, spring. I just want to make sure that my preparations and all my check boxes are checked for those. So I want to have a checklist literally, and uh, make sure that we're pretty much ready for those. And then there's the cleaning up and finalize, finalizing the design for the Spaceport America Cup launch. So our parts not, might not be super presentable as prototypes for maybe something like the test launches, but we want to make them presentable for something like the Spaceport America Cup, so we'll probably refabricate some parts and make them looking good. Um, then later in the year, after we've done most of our work, uh, I want to research and test new ideas for future projects. Any other questions? We're buying them this year because we have a lot of other work to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, graphite. Ideally, I might. I'm looking into that. I, I'm thinking about mixing in either uh, like a liquid lubricant, like a grease and graphite, because the graphite likes to come off really easily. Um, but yeah, uh, ideally. You mentioned, um, for example, temperature differences between when you fly and when you fly in New Mexico. How is the pyrotechnic system safe? Uh, mm. That is a good question. I think that's a yeah, from avionics. From avionics perspective, uh, for the commercial flight computer, it's entirely disconnected from power until it is uh, on the integration or on the pad of red. Uh, for the Escher flight computer, part of that circuit is on, but there is a switch basically between the power techniques and the uh, like electrical system that we made them that is like physically disconnected. Yeah, so that, it'll either be like a key or to rotate, like a screw or like a remote control flight tag. Yeah. And so yeah, both of them are like, it's not just like an electrical disconnect, they're like physically disconnected. And then, so since you've got redundant computers, you have the COTS computer and the SRAC computer, both mm -hmm. trying to deploy these things. 
Yeah, uh, okay, so. How are you going to know which one actually did the job? How are you going to mm. know which Acerac computer actually did the work and the other one was the one that actually did it? That's a good question. Uh, for the ejection canisters, I don't think I, other than like saying, oh, this one was number one and this one was number two, I'm not entirely sure. I suppose I could electro pencil no, uh, numbers onto the ejection canisters. Uh, but for the pyrotechnic pin puller, there's an actual genuine way to know exactly which one failed or which one succeeded or if both of them succeeded. So uh, the way, gosh, I should have put a drawing of that. Um, so the way that the uh, pin puller uh, fires is there's an ideal line that we want to release first because it would slide out quicker. So the computer that we want to try to deploy the uh, pyrotechnics first, we uh, want that one to deploy a particular pin at which, which the line would be wrapped around a certain way. Um, and then the second one would be the redundant one, which would be less optimal. It would take a little bit more time for that uh, line to come off. And that one would be the redundant or the second option computer. So I suppose depending on which lines we see released would uh, determine which computer actually fired. But ideally, it would be both of them. So after each launch, it would be impossible to tell. Also, both flight computers will give us timestamps of when they uh, fire. Mm. So that be, we could maybe look at that in comparison with like acceleration data. We might be able to Mm. I also wanted to, uh, after what Peter said, I kind of wanted to go back on your question about how the pyrotechnics will be saved. Um, usually, with something like the ejection charge canisters, those have most of the uh, most of the gunpowder in them that usually requires a lot more energy to deploy the nose cone. Um, for something like that, it's a lot more difficult to save them. You pretty much just have to uh, have pr protective personal equipment, so a face shield and some flame retardant gloves and you basically go into the recovery bay and you arm them. You basically, so we have a ejection canister and an e-match and a uh, section of black powder, usually in something like a surgical tube, uh, and that's its own separate unit. And you load that in, plug it in, ensure the avionics isn't armed or anything. And then for the pyrotechnic pin puller, there's actually a much easier way to safe it. So essentially, you can uh, unbolt it from the bulkhead. So ideally, I want to have uh, threaded rods as sort of standoffs for the uh, pyrotechnic pin puller. So when you go to actually uh, arm it, you can essentially load your charges, load the whole thing, and make it ready, and then bolt it into the rocket, and then plug it in. So basically, they're pretty much safe. I say pretty much because there's always static electricity. That's why we wear PPE. But they're safe until you plug them in. So. Uh, we have in the past. I plan to in the future. Oh, one question. We got a couple questions online. Oh, lovely. Uh, ben Stubb says, I know you mentioned this a bit, but what specific uh, causes of failures in the last two years, and what has been done to mitigate those issues from happening again? I love that question. Um, okay, so last year our failure was, and that's a picture of our failure. Uh, our failure last year was the. Uh, main parachute shroud lines, so the lines connecting the main parachute to the shock cord, uh, they were not the main cause of failure. <laughs> There's a lot of potential causes of failure. But the main cause of failure was those shroud lines were not retained in the bag properly. So essentially, uh, as we were descending for a test launch, what was our apogee at test launch? Like 10,000 feet, 5,000 feet? Uh, yeah. So as we were descending from 5,000 feet to 1,500 feet, the, uh, everything was fluttering around. And so that actually gave the uh, main shroud lines an opportunity to kind of squeak out of the bag. Um, and that ended up allowing them to wrap themselves around the drogue line, or that long trout cord line there. And they uh, pretty much choked the main parachute bag. Everything else worked properly in the fact that it got to the point where it was deploying the main parachute until those, choke, those lines choked it and caused it to not unfurl. And again, uh, the biggest mitigation we have for that is uh, properly packing the lines. So again, retaining those with breakable restraints so the lines can't flop out, they can't unfurl. Um, another thing is allow, making sure the bag is closing better. So that bag in the past, that bag design was not optimal. Um, it was a prototype that got turned into the main production model that got turned into a modified main production model. Um, 
So it was kind of band-aided together, uh, which obviously isn't ideal. And so we're going with a much more refined bag design this year. Um, it also, this last year's bag design was opened at the side. This would, and it was uh, also cylindrical. So when it was pulled under tension, it was more like an egg shape. So the idea was that if it was split at the side a little bit, that would A, make it easier to sew, and B, it would make it uh, more easy for the parachute to come out. It did make it more easy for the parachute to come out, but just at the wrong time. So again, this year, we're going with a conical bag to help with the parachute coming out. Um, this also uh, better distributes the load. So basically, if you're pulling on a cone versus pulling on a cylinder, the cone sort of retains its shape a lot better, whereas a cylinder deforms into an egg shape, which isn't great. Um, what was I saying? Oh, uh, and the year before that, there was a fun decision to, uh, in order to release the main parachute, they wanted electrical lines going from the main body tube up to the shock, up into the shock cord where the bag was. Yeah, when you have electrical lines going along a shock cord that's twisting around like crazy and it's getting all bunched up, they're gonna snap. And that's exactly what they did. So they couldn't deploy the main parachute because the electrical signal was lost between avionics and the recovery uh, pyrotechnics because the electrical lines were twisted until they, I can't remember if it was unplugged or snapped, but either way, you get the same problem. Um, another thing that we've done, um, I don't know why we did this last year, but the main parachute bag was attached to extremely long shock cord lines. I think this was just to reduce the uh, amount of shock on the bag. Um, we're going to be testing that this year, but considering the material that the bag is made of um, and the strength of our lines, it shouldn't be a problem to shorten those lines drastically to the point where the bag is very close to the main rocket body while it's descending. This will prevent it from twisting a lot more. Um, it'll prevent it from going around like crazy like it was. Well, it'll still go around like crazy, but that's why we have line packing techniques. So. Great. And that is over our five minutes, so we'll oh. wrap up questions for now until after the entire presentation. Okay. I'm going to hand it off to Corey, our uh, payload lead, for his next slides. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as Calvin said, I'm Corey Ireland. I am our payload lead this year. Um, let's begin. So project purpose. On a high level, payload is what it says it is. It is the whole reason we fly the rocket. It is the scientific experiment slash technical demonstrator that goes on the rocket, launches, and then when we recover the rocket, we pull the payload out of the rocket. On a high, at a high level, we, our goal is to design and manufacture a metal bay conforming to a five U CubeSat structure. Now, for those of you who are familiar with uh, our payloads in the past, that five U is not a typo. Usually we do three, but this year is five U for reasons which I will explain later. And for those who aren't familiar at all with payloads, one U is essentially a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. And so five U is essentially stacking five of those on top of each other, forming a structure that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 50 centimeters. We're also looking to incorporate an outreach payload through our outreach program that we go out to Metro High School, which is just across the river, right next to campus. And we go through a miniature design process with a class of students there. They come up with a payload. We then build it and integrate it into a one U section reserved for them at the top of our payload. Our, our main goal of the scientific portion is to build, is to rotate a, what we're calling a stabilization capsule to maintain the orientation of a scientific experiment that goes inside that capsule relative to the rocket's acceleration. We're also looking to reduce the vibrational loading on that capsule and rotation system. We're also seeking to um, take advantage of that shock, of vibrational, shock and vibrational absorption system to protect a thermophilic ye yeast in flight throughout all flight regimes from ascent through to parachute deployment all the way down to when it lands on the ground. And lastly, we are, of course, looking to win the payload award com competition in June. System requirements. Well, payload shall be self-contained. That is an Ezra requirement, something we have to do. It also cannot alter the flight path. Since it is a payload, we have to be, by Ezra regulations, we have to be able to replace it with an inert mass of the same mass, and the rocket should fly the exact same. Additionally, it needs to be within 3.81 kilograms and 4.08 kilograms. That lower bound is an Ezra requirement. The upper bound is a requirement that was set by our project manager. 
Um, and lastly, we do not want to lose the potentially quite valuable biological material that we will have contained within the sphere. So you guys see general design here. Oh, I can point with the cursor. Um, this is that stabilization capsule I was talking about. It is mounted on those these three motorized wheels that are going to rotate it around while the rocket is in flight. Um, and you can see also the 1U payload up there that's empty. That is reserved for the um, outreach payload that we are currently engaged in the outreach program at Metro High School. So overall kind of design process for the entire payload, uh, moving from 3U to 5U was a big decision that we made over the summer. As you could see in those CAD models on the slide prior, we have absolutely zero extra room. So that was our big justification for um, making that change and increasing the length of payload. However, despite the fact that payload is 66% bigger than in years prior, that's not going to impact the weight at all. It is still going to be at that roughly four kilogram mark. And in order to accomplish that goal, we've made a lot of weight conscious decisions. Um, a lot of the panels that we have in the in the payload are either steel or aluminum. When we in initiated our design process, those were all steel. So we had the most conservative possible estimate. And in order to determine you know, how many panels need to be steel, how many, how many need, need to be aluminum, we've taken advantage of a mass tracking system that I've developed. Basically, in short, we have a whole list of our parts that are in the payload. And we have a list of how much we project their weight based on either CAD models or weighing them themselves. And then we give it what I'm calling a maturity code that essentially dictates how much could that weight of that part change as the design of the entire payload and of that part itself matures. That all comes out to this wonderful graph you can see here, which shows how our estimated mass ch is changing as the year progresses. This central blue line is our estimated mass of the entire payload once it um, is finished being built. The orange line is a conservative um, towards the upper bound, and the green line is conservative towards the lower bound of how the mass of the payload might shrink. The reason we have that, that, that lower bound is because we have a minimum weight, which usually isn't the case when you're looking at professional projects in industry. And the red and darker green bounds are those um, is that 4.08 kilograms and the 3.68 kilograms that we have to end up with between. So as the year goes on, we're hoping to see all of these lines converge to be between these bars once we come around to test launches and our competition. So now on to our stabilizer system. One of the big decisions we had to make early in the year was what is our configuration of wheels and cameras. Obviously the wheels turn the, turn the capsule and the cameras will be tracking dots that we're placing on the capsule in order to, in order to determine exactly where is, what is the capsule's orientation at the current point. So in order to kind of decide what is the best configuration, you know, where are the wheels going, where are the cameras going, we built a, a small ray tracing library that we are using, that we used and ran through essentially, I think, way more than the six, but we went through probably dozens of different configurations of cameras and motors and basically simulating those and basically where the cameras can see on the capsule and running through all the potential orientations of the capsule while it's in flight and seeing, okay, can we see every single orientation under every possible condition? So as you can see, this lower, this last simulation we ran was the one that achieved 100% coverage of all possible orientations of that sphere. And that is with four cameras above the sphere, all three motors down below, and then a ring support system that is segmented that is keeping the ball in place. Additionally, um, that whole system is spring-loaded, that whole rotation system, which allows us to maintain constant pressure on the sphere throughout all regimes of flight, both when we're accelerating, so the sphere is trying to go down, and then when we're decelerating after burnout and there's high drag on the rocket, the sphere is trying to go up. Additionally, it allows us for manufacturing error since we only have the capability to produce parts that are so precise. Having that spring loading allows us to make sure that we know exactly how much force is on the sphere and how much traction those motors are going to be getting. Um, here is a little bit of the results of our ray tracing analysis. This is for that final configuration that we went with. You can see the four cameras up top and then those segmented ring supports. This is a bit of a heat map of um, what the cameras see. So the green spaces are where the camera's looking directly down on the sphere. The red is where it's a bit more of tangential. And then the blue and cyan are where the cameras are being occluded by the um, supports, as you can kind of see up there. Okay, now on for our mechanical system. Um, the big thing here, the big challenge has been the capsule rotation system. In order to, um, as part of our early testing, we realized that a 3D printed plastic sphere um, trying to be rotated by acetyl plastic wheels meant that there was absolutely no traction, so it was almost impossible for the wheels to actually turn the sphere. 
cell. To solve this, we decided to coat the sphere with a styrene butadiene copolymer, which is essentially a sprayable rubber, in order to drastically increase that coefficient of friction, allowing us to move the sphere with those slippery plastic acetal wheels. As I mentioned here, these wheels are omnidirectional, which um, means that even if you're trying to rotate the sphere against, in the essentially the perpendicular direction to the wheel, the, all the wheels basically have little wheels on them that allow that to happen with a minimum of friction. Additionally, as of right now, we have, in the design, we have, if you can see up above the sphere, those are custom ball bearings, so there are little metal balls in there that give us a minimum of friction on the upper end of the sphere as well. Lastly, um, not depicted here, because it's not quite, the design is not quite finished, is our shock and vibrational absorption system, which is the other half of the mechanical portion of the payload. Essentially, it is a dampening load distributing prism factor, um, essentially sandwiching this entire system. So we'll have a layer up here and a layer down here of a hexagonal um, polymer that will allow the, this whole system to kind of shake and move to hopefully reduce the amount of vibrations and shocks that this entire stabilization system experiences. And due to the fact that this is all going to be kind of sandwiched together inside our payload bay means that there's going to be no mount, not no mounting, there are not going to be screw mounting so that way it will allow the honeycomb um, structure to retain its flexibility and its elasticity. As for the electrical systems, obviously, since we have a ton of moving parts, there's a lot of electrical components that go into this. Um, the microcontroller we decided to select due to its ease of use, given that none of us in the program, the program team, nope, the um, payload team are experts at programming, is the Raspberry Pi. That Raspberry Pi feeds into a motor controller that, the, that will control the motors and rotate that capsule. Additionally, due to the fact that we're using four cameras and the Raspberry Pi only has one camera slot, we're taking advantage of a commercial off-the-shelf camera combiner that allows us to take all four of those cameras and combine them into one feed. Additionally, those four cameras, the specific model is an Adafruit IMX708, which gives us the correct field of view that we need in order for all that ray tracing I mentioned earlier is predicated on the field of view of those cameras. Second to lastly, we have a pair of accelerometers. One accelerometer which you can see right, ooh, whoa, I don't know what happened. Okay, I'm not gonna move the mouse anymore. <laughs> one, one accelerometer you can see there in the electronics bay is our baseline kind of control accelerometer that tells us what direction is the rocket going in, which then informs which direction do we need to rotate the capsule. A second accelerometer is going to go inside that stabilizer bay, um, which will be affected by the, that shock and vibration absorption. So we can compare the results from those two accelerometers to see just how effective is that honeycomb polymer at absorbing the vibrations of the rocket. Lastly, to kind of combine everything together, because like I kind of mentioned earlier, Raspberry Pi can only do so much by itself, we are taking advantage of a solderable breadboard in order to kind of combine all those inputs and all those I2C sensors. So biological experiment. We don't, want just, we don't just want this to be a technical demonstrator of our rotation and vibrational system. We also want to take advantage of it to conduct an actual scientific experiment. So we are collaborating with the Ohio State Microbiology Department in order to launch a sample of a biological material on the payload. The, the, due to several conditions, including the temperature that's in the rocket, as well as requiring the sample to be, to be fragile enough to potentially die, we chose a thermophilic yeast. The purpose of this experiment is to have one sample in that, in that spherical capsule, one sample outside the capsule, somewhere else in the payload, and one sample on the ground as a control. The goal is to see if our stabilization and vibrational system can help protect the yeast to keep it alive. In an ideal world, all the yeast that's in, outside that stabilizer all dies, and all the yeast that's inside the stabilizer is perfectly fine and still alive, thereby proving out the technology that we can use it to launch more fragile materials. In terms of post-flight analysis, unfortunately we can't bring an entire biology lab to New Mexico, so we're going to do what we can at the hotel upon launch. One idea that we're discussing with the biology department is dyeing the samples to determine um, casualty rate from the flight. And of course, after the launch, and once we return to Ohio State, we will be bringing the samples back to the microbiology department so they can do their in-depth analysis. That's kind of what they get out of this. Additionally, we, uh, apart from the hardware electrical system, we also have a fairly, by my standards, complex, and by payload standards, complex software system. I'm not, I don't want, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but essentially we start out with our computer vision algorithm that takes the inputs from the cameras and outputs, okay, where are the dots on the sphere and where does that mean the sphere is actually rotated? And then we do, we essentially feed that into a PID loop based off accelerometer data of, okay, where is the capsule pointing and where does it need to point? And then using that 
TID information to feed values into the motors. Risk to project success. Um, the biggest risk I would say would be a structural failure of the payload. So if parts aren't up to the strength they need to be in order to endure 20 um, Gs of acceleration, obviously a lot of our parts are a lot thinner this year because we're trying to save weight, trying to stay within that four kilogram limit. Additionally, it's possible that due to the way we store the thermophilic yeast, it might get compromised. It might, I don't want to use the word escape because it's not like really alive. Well, it's alive, but um, we don't want that to leak out. Um, additionally, it's possible that because we don't really have the capability to test our control system under a high G environment, it's possible that, that that doesn't act how we intend it to once we're under that 20 Gs of loading. And lastly, the, motor, the motors that we selected have a maximum temperature listing on the website of 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we don't anticipate the rocket getting up that high. I, the number we've been using is about 125 Fahrenheit, but that is a possibility that we think could potentially happen. In terms of risk mitigation and our matrix, the payload structural failure, there's a lot we can do there. We are planning on, before, before test launch, running our entire payload structure through a lot of ANSYS calculations, both um, straight up um, structural through the 20G acceleration, as well as following NASA standards for um, structural, or not structural, vibrational analysis of, of rocket payloads. Additionally, we are looking into finding a shake table we can use in order to physically test the actual flight model of the payload in order, to, in order to ensure that it will not only survive structurally, but also to make sure electro, electrical connections and other things of that sort are sound. In terms of the thermophilic yeast um, not being compromised, we are looking at redundant containment of that yeast, so not only having it in the container that the biology department gives us, but also having it surrounded by thermal insulation, as well as it also being stored in that capsule itself. So there's almost three layers of protection there. Um, third one is having the control system failing in, a, in the high G environment. We're hoping to reduce, mitigate this risk for the test for the competition flight by having it fully operational for the test flight. So we'll have, since we're plant, since the project is planning two test flights, we we'll essentially have two runs to see if that control system works, and we'll be able to tweak it between flights to try and make sure that it will function as intended. Lastly, for the motor maximum temperatures being exceeded, we will be painting the rocket predominantly white, hopefully reflecting as much radiation away as possible, as well as not having any panels on the payload this year in order to increase and make sure that there's no obstructions to airflow. Um, in terms of the impact, that is all relative to the payload itself, since there is a negligible chance of the payload impacting the overall rocket's flight as is an ESRA requirement. Our plan for the year, um, the Fall semester has been primarily focused more on the mechanical design, mechanical prototyping. Right now we are involved in the prototype assembly process and iterating that prototype to try and improve the mechanical systems. We are also working hard on our computer vision algorithms to make sure that the, that the cameras will be able to see those dots under the lighting conditions that will be present on the inside of the rocket. Once the mechanical prototype is finished and we finish putting together all the electrical components, we are working to have basic control algorithms done by the end of the semester, basically proving, okay, can we move the sphere in a coordinated manner? When, now jumping into next semester, we're hoping to integrate those basic controls in with our computer vision algorithm. So basically saying, okay, now can we move the capsule to a dedicated position based off of what those cameras are telling us? Um, finally, in January and February, we are looking to assemble those actual bays. Contrary to years past, uh, whereas where we were, we basically built the bay and then that dictated the design of what went inside the bay, it's kind of a, a reverse this year. This year we're designing the mechanical portions of the stabilizer and that's driving the bay design in order to make things as easy as possible to assemble, which has been an issue in the past. Um, then in, in that January, February time as well, once we complete the outreach program, which is underway right now, we will be designing and assembling that outreach payload and integrating it into that top U of the payload. And lastly, in March and April, once we go through our first couple test flights, we will be refining the controls algorithm and continue to make that as smooth as possible. All right, any questions? Declan. Um, so the, the yeast is thermophilic. Yes. Um, The sample that is outside of the um, capsule will also have thermal insulation. So ideally, 
when, once we finish the design, everything will be the same between those two samples except the vibrational system. Yes, that is um, part of the process of selecting the thermophilic yeast with the microbiology department. One of the conditions that I laid out for them is it has to be mechanically weak. Okay. The cells themselves, yes. That is why we couldn't use, one of the big contenders was a um, benign strain of E. coli. However, the cell wall in E. coli is particularly strong, so we had to discount that because in all likelihood it was not going to be affected by the vibrations of launch. The G levels they will feel, but there shouldn't be as much shaking if the vibrational system is at, performs as intended. But the G levels aren't high enough that that would be what kills them? No, because that's more of a smooth, there's a lot less jerk there. The fourth, third or fourth derivative of acceleration. Or position. <laughs> Yes. This is a full, or do you want I have a prototype and I have this? Um, acceleration or velocity? Um, yes, that, this is its orientation in the rocket. So on launch, it's, the acceleration is going to be up, but after motor burnout, when we have high drag, it's going to be in the opposite direction. Yes. So going up the hill, that's how many, how many, how many Gs? Um, I think it's 18 Gs on acceleration, uh, on um, launch. So there's plenty of stickiness between the wheels and the ball, all mm -hmm. the motors. And then when the motor stops, what's to keep the ball from sort of just floating there and not having enough contact with the wheels and the wheels? Um, that is why we have the spring loading. You can see the springs up top here. Those are conditioned to, I believe right now, it's about provide about four pounds of force always on the wheels. So that way there's always that um, friction there. So that's actually pushing down? Yes, down. yes. So you, I don't know if you, how well you can see it, but there are, um, there are collars. This whole system is self-contained, so those collars keep everything together and are pushing those springs so there's always that force on the ball no matter what. And that force is transmitted through these, uh, these supports here. So that force is not sufficient enough to lock the ball down? What is the interface between that? Um, the interface right here? Yeah, what is that interface? Um, those are, so these um, parts, where did the cursor go? These parts have um, cavities in them that we have ball bearings in. Okay. That is the interface there, yeah. So that's, that's pressure yes, that is that was the idea. In order to kind of the big thing was a fight basically between the friction of the wheels and the friction of those bearings to see because in order for it to turn, there's be more friction from the wheels than from the bearings, and that's the goal is to achieve that. So can you remind me, obviously you can spin the ball, where do we want it to point, why do we want it to change, what's going to make it change, like, mm -hmm. it's sitting there, it's being held, you know, it largely wants to stay exactly where it is the entire time, yeah. you just tell it to spin, and just tell it to spin? Yeah, so I think the, the original um, idea behind this was looking at, we were inspired by what we saw at, at the Space World Competition this year, we saw there was an Indian team that had a little platform that did something very similar. And my thought there was that, okay, that platform works, but because it's just a level thing, it can only rotate to so many degrees. Whereas this system can rotate, it can point in any direction because it's mounted on wheels. So the idea is that, now this isn't necessarily applicable for our particular scientific experiment, but we're proving out that if you have something fragile that needs to, that can only, let's say, endure forces in one direction, then you could put that in the capsule and no matter which direction the forces are on in the rocket, 
it would survive. So now during liftoff, of course, it's all just through the bottom, so the sphere's not gonna move much. But when we look at when, this, when the rocket is descending and it's swinging under uh, chute and it hits the ground at a high angle, this system will keep the sphere in its orientation so that whatever is inside is being um, loaded on its strong axis. So if that was the thought, why wouldn't you put a fragile non-biological thing inside to show that it stayed oriented the way it was supposed to be oriented at the time of the whole flight and didn't break and blah, blah, blah. What, why did jump over to adding a biological to this? Um, we went, we did do, do quite a, we spent a few meetings brainstorming on this. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with the complications of the fact that it's only a, that's a four, four inch ball, so we had to do something that's small enough. Now if we upsize this, it'd be a lot easier to put something like that in there, but because the sphere is so small, it really limited our options, and um, that kind of biological sample is something that's easy enough to put in a really small container. Additionally, it's, it was, easy enough because we can't put any electronics in there. I mean, we could, but again, that's adding a whole other layer of complexity and a second electrical system. So that biological material is something that's easy enough to take out post-launch and do our analysis on. So with your cameras and the motorized wheels at the bottom, what's the plan for spinning? Are we gonna end up with total material? This is the orientation, this is what it was doing. What are we gonna know during and after the flight about? Mm -hmm. Orientation. Yeah, we are we are planning on storing, um, continuously storing the orientation of the ball as well as the rockets, um, the, that acceleration vector. So that way we can compare, we can graph over the course of the launch. You know, what is the error between the ball's orientation and the rocket acceleration vector? And you want it to stay constant. We would, we want we want those to be perfectly aligned at all times, uh, as, at least as close as possible. Accelerating up and accelerating down, which are going to be most of what's going mm -hmm. on. Is that the same alignment for what you're talking about? Um, we want the ball to turn 180 degrees. The, go, the goal is down the goal is to have the ball turning 180 degrees. Yes, that hence the hence the whole ball system instead of just a little platform like the like the other team we saw had. Declan. Um, we are planning on running, so in, in, in parallel with continuing the mechanical design of, um, of it for the rest of the semester, I'm planning on having several people working on that whole thing of seeing, once we have the basic computer vision running, putting that on the Raspberry Pi and seeing how fast that's going to run to make sure it's going to be fast enough. All right, so that concludes. All right, so that concludes our preliminary design review. Thank you to all of you, especially in the room, for sticking it through for the past three hours, and thank you to everyone online uh, for also staying. Uh, we really appreciate all the feedback and questions that we get from you guys. Uh, we'll plan to implement it and look through all the data that you guys wrote on the uh, RID sheets. Um, and we just really appreciate you all taking the time to come out. Um, at this time, we can take any remaining questions that anybody might have. I know that we had a couple in the chat, and if there's any in the audience, uh, now's the time to ask them. So we've got one question in the chat uh, through recovery. Um, they want to know what other me methods of tensile testing will you be doing on the shock port? You said what other methods? Um, yes. What methods of testing? Uh, well, methods of testing, I would just say tilt failure. So basically when you go online, you get a, a tension rating of a certain shock cord, and you've also got an internal uh, stress rating uh, that Kevlar has, but we don't know what that exact value is. We don't know what the factor safety that the manufacturer applies if they don't get sued when the shock cord snap. Um, so we just want to test what the actual failure is so that we can apply our own factors of safety uh, to basically be within those margins. 
Uh, and for those online that might not be able to hear because our setup's a little different right now than it was during the other question periods, uh, for tensile testing, the shock cord, essentially we're testing it to failure uh, so that we can validate the manufacturer's um, loads. All right, do we have any other questions in the audience? So this is just in general to all of you. Uh, there's a lot of flight testing that you want to do, and I realize some of that you do with test launches, but some things you want to test before then. Any thought of like weather balloon type, get it up to a certain height, it'll pop, it can fall, we can test some things without some of the risks of you know solid rocket motors and some of that involved. Because shockingly, you can get away with doing all sorts of things with balloons, and the government doesn't seem to care. I, it's very weird, but they let you do it. You can fly massive intelligent payloads over yes. the entire continent. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it down until it's over the continent, right? I mean, yeah. um, you know, so when you talk about drop testing and things, deploying of a parachute, you can get high enough to have it have time to fall and do things. Just throwing it out there. I, I'm not saying you need to. Just a weird idea, you know, you can't get somebody to just fly an airplane and let you chuck things out the window or something. Yeah, I believe the government has a little, like, uh, meter, and it has a little marker on it, and it goes from no reaction to sidewater missile. <laughs> <laughs> um, do any of you guys have anything you would like to say to that? Uh, no. I know. Like In the past, uh, avionics, or it could have been a pre-avionics team, they did a weather balloon test on their own crew systems. Uh, I was talking to Nick Flesher about that at the institution of this very uh, Anyways, yeah, we were in contact with some alumni about that and possibly looking at doing something like that with time about other communications. If I may, as far as recovery is concerned, um, we, we're dealing with much heavier uh, loads than what. Uh, weather balloon could send up, so we'd have to do a scaled uh, model of our recovery system. So again, we're dealing with a 45 pound rocket, so we're anticipating the loads that a 45 pound rocket would apply to the actual system. Uh, from what I've found, the, yeah, a payload balloon, or sorry, a weather balloon that, <laughs> a weather balloon that could hold anything anywhere near that is in the orders of several hundred or even thousand dollars. Um, that's not within our budget. <laughs> Um, uh, skydiving instructor saying he'll throw stuff out of a plane for us is free. So, yeah. All right. And any other questions? I've got one more in chat. Um, Noah McGillivray wants to know from Propulsion how much space is between the top of the propellant stack and the forward closure? Uh, three, around three inches. Um, yeah, so Noah, for your question about the amount of space between the propellant stack and the forward closure, uh, about three inches estimate. We'll have to get a more exact number uh, from part looking at the Brinson file. All right, and if that's all from the chat and all from the audience, uh, thank you all again for coming. We really appreciate all the feedback. If you just want to leave the forms under the tables, we can grab those from you. All right.